City of North Glen Channel 8, keeping you informed of events in your community. Good evening and welcome to our March 18th City Council Study Session. Joanna, would you call the roll please? Mayor Dodge. Here. <clears throat> Mayor Pro Tem Escobar. Here. Council Member Sowers. Council Member Lighty. Here. Council Member Downey. Here. Council Member Brown will be absent. Council Member Whitman. Here. Council Member Duran Molica. Here. Council Member Wilford. Here. Okay, thank you. And we with our first item this evening, which is the review of the schematic design for the Recreation Center. And Amanda Peterson will be leading the discussion. All right, I'll give everybody a minute to get up here. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I'm Amanda Peterson, Director of Parks, Recreation, and Culture. And we are really excited tonight to present to you the schematic design for the new Recreation Center, Senior Center, and Theater, um, as well as the associated infrastructure components. Um, we have started rolling this plan, this des schematic design out to staff, as well as the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board to get feedback. So far, that's been very positive. Um, what we're hoping for tonight is for one, you to provide us any feedback that you have on the schematic design, um, and two, to kind of give your consensus to move forward with the design development phase. So with that, I would like to introduce our consultant team. We have Daniel with Barker Ranker Seacat, and Paul with MIG. Um, Chris from Semple Brown, who is our theater sub consultant, will be here shortly. So once he gets in here, we'll, we'll bring him on up. We've also got a few other members of the team back in the back. We've got Frank with BRS, Jen, and Dave also with Barker Rinker Seacat. Um, so with that, I'd like to turn it over to Daniel. Sure. Want me to run the, sure. or do you want to go? <coughs> oh, I guess it would help if we turn the projector on, because otherwise I'm the only one watching the presentation. Uh -oh. warming up a little bit here. Okay. Turn that on. Now we're good to go. Well, thank you for having us. Um, again, I'm Daniel with BRS. Uh, we're leading the team, but um, we are, we consider um, all of our team as partners, um, so don't look at, as, as, at us as the leaders, but more as just one of the partners, because it takes a, a group of us uh, to really deliver something special. Um, so again, I'm Daniel, this is Paul, Chris will be here in a few minutes. Um, first, I wanted to say um, we are extremely excited. Uh, Dave's been working on this project in some form or fashion for, I don't know, years and years now so we're excited uh, to see it come to fruition um, and we're excited for you guys so thank you again um, the first thing that we wanted to just review uh, sort of at a high level was uh, a brief schedule uh, to just give you a little update as to where we're at um, so uh, today we've completed the schematic design phase which is uh, really a phase where we're um, taken what we've seen and what we've done in the feasibility phase and further developed it, um, gotten input from some of our consultant team, um, looked briefly at the structure, looked, looked at what's underground, um, and sort of tightened it up so it looks more like a real building. Um, in the next phase, which is design development, we'll start to make more decisions about things like materials and actual size. We'll meet with the um, state of Colorado licensing people. We'll meet with Tri-County Health. We'll meet, start meeting with all these agencies to make sure what we come out with in design development is easy to build, uh, meet your budget, 
and meets all of the requirements of both uh, you guys and the community. And then when we move uh, to construction documents, that's really when we start to go to detailed level of design and really look at the details, how materials come together, how the building is really waterproofed. Um, all those types of things um, really come into, into play when we get to construction documents um, later on here in the year. Um, and then as we move forward into agency review, that's when we turn it over to SafeBuilt and say, hey guys, we believe that this meets the intent of the building code and all the other applicable um, codes. What do you guys think? And we, we're able to provide a set of documents that gives um, our, our uh, GC the ability to pull a permit to actually go and build something. Uh, from there, we estimate uh, construction start in about fall of 2019. Uh, so we'll start doing uh, a majority of the, the site work to start off. Um, and then we're looking at maybe a building construction start. So you'll see things start to rise up out of the ground uh, somewhere in the first quarter. Um, we're still working that sort of detailed construction schedule out at the moment. Uh, <coughs> that's where we're headed. And uh, depending on where all that lays, we're looking at about fall of 2021, maybe uh, for a grand opening. Um, we, we, we are working with our at GC at the moment to make sure that'll, that'll all work out. But I think that's where we're we're ready to say that that's our goal for the moment. Okay. Um, so I'd like to go ahead and we'll move through, <coughs> excuse me, um, the project. Uh, we'll start with the site, then we'll go to the building, and the building is split up in the various pieces, and then we'll finally end um, sort of with the exterior design. So, Paul? Good evening. As Daniel mentioned, I'm with MIG in probably know us from the master plan process. Jay said his regard from the well, movies in Mexico yet, but he's working on that. Um, so we'll focus on the site, uh, do a quick overview, try to keep it to around 10 minutes. So it's a pretty high level, um, and you're welcome to ask questions at any time naturally. And we represent the site team, which is including civil for Mark Martin, uh, lighting, uh, irrigation, the whole folks who have to do with the ground around the project. And we'll start with an overview plan. And uh, phase one is kind of the color portion of this. As you can see, it's sort of a T-shaped form. You have I-25 on the left-hand side, and we probably all well know this, but we'll just make sure. And then Community Center to Drive is on the right. Of course, E.B. Rains Park, immediately adjacent to that. Uh, the building we're in now, City Hall, is uh, to the south of the east-west portion of phase one, which is Memorial Parkway, uh, City Hall and the recreation center to the north will be preserved during construction. And uh, the rec center itself is kind of the white rectangle in the, on the left-hand side of the screen tucked up against I-25. Uh, you'll access the, the rec center, theater, senior center uh, from, from two different points. The rec center from the east side just at the end of Memorial Parkway and the theater and senior center from the south side off the large parking lot uh, south of the building. Uh, to the north, the existing detention pond will be expanded and become a kind of a regional pond for the entire campus. And um, we will uh, also have uh, amenities along Memorial Parkway. And, uh, and, and as you can see, it's fairly well landscaped and we want to make sure this is a, a really great civic campus when we're done, a place that the community will be proud of and has a really lush green feel to it. And of course, we'll meet all of the requirements of the UDO. There are patios and outdoor spaces associated with the building for the community room, the senior center, and then of course for the pool there's a deck and Daniel will get into those in more detail. <laughs> we'll start with parking. Uh, during construction, all of the, most of the lots associated with the existing buildings are left open. The two lots associated with the recreation, the existing recreation center. Uh, once again, phase one is the dark area in gray. And then there are two lots associated with this building, the one to the east and the one immediately at the main entry. The one to the west will be closed during construction. And when that is complete, then we'll have the full complement of parking on board. Uh, during phase one, it's uh, I think 233 spaces or 274 and then at opening 533. 
The areas in purple that you see here are the ones immediately adjacent to the building, the lot to the south uh, off the theater senior center entry in along Memorial Parkway in the north-south road we've dubbed Theater Drive for lack of a better name at this point in time. The, the existing parking lots will remain in, in, in uh, as function during the uh, once phase one is complete. Um, as will the, and we would be restoring a 29 space lot immediately to the west of the building and there's a, a 40 space lot south of the south access drive, the existing road to this building that is a, kind of a native grass area that will be available for overflow parking. Can you see that one more time? The it's that same space we use for current event overflow um, between City Hall and In the, the apartment. Blank slide was the one, so we'll, get, we'll circle back to that after we answer. That blank slide up there yeah. was this. Shoot, whatever it is. That's right. Yeah. We have some really great renderings. <laughs> they have them, so. Yeah. yeah, we'll come back to that. Yeah. Um, Vehicular circulation, um, Memorial Parkway will be the primary access the public will take into the rec center down the, uh, the, the two-way uh, two, uh, two road coming in off Community Center Drive. And that will allow people to uh, access the parking on Theater Drive and then to the south parking lot to the south and enter the building. Um, fire will be able to use all of the roads. It will be designed to the fire district standards. And, uh, and so those, are, uh, those will be accessible in all cases. We uh, have our a second route identified for larger vehicles like buses and trash trucks and service and delivery vehicles. And that way they would come in on the south access drive along City Hall Road here and then go south and around the west side of the building via a one-way loop uh, along I-25. And that's where a lot of the service functions for the building and then a continuum to the north side. Uh, that loop will then connect back to Theater Drive. We have eventually this the road servicing this building will be replaced by a future road, which you see is the kind of double-headed arrow on the bottom of the image here, and, uh, and, and also will make connections to future development, maybe roads connecting if the two north and south outlaw parcels, um, north and south of uh, Memorial Parkway, if those develop, then they might have their own internal circulation. For uh, those traveling on foot or on bikes, um, we've got access basically preserved throughout the site. Um, the areas in blue that you see in the slide are the areas that have to be a little bit flatter to accommodate um, uh, handicapped parking spaces, accessible routes for plazas which need to be fairly flat like the entry plaza for the theater and senior center, the entry plaza for the recreation center, also for the, um, the uh, handicapped spaces on Memorial Parkway. And then we have the blue dots blue lines with the dots in them are the accessible routes. We uh, have other walking ways into the into the site to the existing city hall and, to, and of course to the existing rec center kind of not on this slide. We can access the south entry through the parking lot through a pair of walks going through a, a landscaped island. And we have a major uh, east-west pedestrian path that runs north of Memorial Drive from E.B. Rains Park and then turning north and connects to eventually to the RTD underpass around the detention pond on the north side of the site. And you'll see this in, in a little more detail in future slides. So I want to focus on Memorial Parkway. It's basically organized into three basic areas, uh, the drop off for the recreation uh, center entry, which is on the <coughs> east side of the building, and the, uh, the we've called the Festival Lawn area, and also the Veterans Memorial area. We'll start with Veterans Memorial. We think this is just going to be a fabulous space. We just, well, we love the sculpture. That will remain in place. It'll be protected during construction. It, uh, elevation won't change. But the area around it will be refurbished and a, and a new plaza will be created. Uh, we are looking to give a, a contemplative, dignified space that is uh, richly detailed. Uh, we're proposing what we've called the service ribbon paving design for the plaza, where you see the kind of the idea that bars on the ribbons will be, be, be repeated in the plaza. The pavers from the existing, the dedication pavers from the existing plaza will be salvaged and incorporated into that paving pattern. And you've got an endless amount of dedication pavers if you'd like 
to if the community would like to add more. That would be surrounded by a series of low walls with some, with some uh, planners associated with it. We see those as an opportunity to um, maybe tell a story about some of your residents and their, their experiences in the various conflicts. Uh, maybe personalize it a bit and repeat that service ribbon with that image and things. And we think that may be a great, might be a great way to do it. The existing flagpole, uh, the two monuments that have the bronze plaques would be relocated within the plaza. It'd be surrounded by a group of evergreen trees to, uh, you can start to see the, the white uh, path going along the north side. That's the 12 foot recreation path for bikes and pedestrians to enter from E.B. Rains Park. That would be, the plaza would be screened by a series of evergreens. And so it'd be a really nice space. Still a good south orientation, still a great presence to the street and uh, would, I think, really be a great entry uh, for the Civic Campus and really kind of respect your history and, and the, the, the residents and the, your veterans' history. So I have a question about um, the memorial. And I, I know we don't really have a lot of that specifically around the memorial. <coughs> You know, with this, I don't know if we would one one day. Is there gonna? I'm, sh I'm assuming there's gonna be like electricity in there. There's gonna be ability to get an AV system nicely out there. Like, are we thinking about what we might use this for in the future and how we can easily, you know, hook into power <laughs> and having that? There? We haven't talked about the power needs, okay. so I'll let Paul um, comment on that. Um, but I believe our intention would be to, at a minimum, continue to do our Veterans Day celebration at that location. Right, there would absolutely be uh, okay. power receptacles there for that sort of thing. Whether there's a dedicated AV system, that would be a, a, a detailed design element. Yeah, but as said, a lot of those functions could still happen. Absolutely. And, the, and you'll notice there's a lawn area kind of around it on the north side with some opportunities for seating and gathering. That could theoretically be available for special events if you have something that's really large and wants to take up a lot of space. So focusing on the festival lawn, which is between the Veterans Memorial Plaza and the Recreation Center, once again on the north side of the, uh, of the uh, Memorial Parkway. And you'll notice, by the way, that there was no parking adjacent to the Veterans Memorial. The angle parking is at the west westerly block and along the south side of Memorial Parkway. So this is what I've kind of dubbed the Swiss Army knife of public spaces. It's a, it's a very flexible space, a lawn area that's available for casual recreation, throwing a frisbee, just relaxing on the grass, reading a book, um, places for food trucks to come in and uh, coffee and lunches or whatever. Um, you could have, uh, you know, it could be programmed, there could be opportunities for, for games or uh, play for adults and, and children together. So. Um, a really flexible space, a couple different plazas that be available for, for a lot of different things. Uh, it, it, uh, it can be converted to a, uh, a movie night theater, uh, a movie night place. The, west, the eastern plaza that you can see in the slide with the blue rectangle, that would be a food truck, but the food truck could move out. You'd bring in a movie screen. Now you've got this lawn available for summer movies. You bring in a portable stage, now it's a concert venue. And so you've got an opportunity for people to sit on a lawn and enjoy a concert. From a festival standpoint, there's all kinds of availability here. You've got the lawn itself, you've got the 12 foot wide sidewalks uh, that could be closed off the, uh, the multi-use path. You've got the opportunity of just closing off the angle parking, setting up tents in that. You can actually close the entirety of Memorial Parkway and have a major festival, a major art festival, a fire festival, whatever it is. Um, you've got that opportunity with this venue. So anything can happen here, and I think it's, we think it's a great space that uh, people will really enjoy coming in the future. Um, we also have, uh, we'll focus quickly on the outdoor space that's associated with the, uh, with the preschool area, and this is the primary outdoor recreation for that facility, and uh, it'll be designed to meet all the codes that Daniel mentioned, and as such, we have to provide uh, X number of square feet of different services, so there would be a paved area that not only provides emergency exit for the building, but could provide, if it's marked for games, uh, uh, big wheels, things like that, it could provide that type of recreation. There would be a small play area and a resilient surfacing, something very colorful and fun. Those need to be designed and programmed yet and selected. Uh, a small area of turf with a shade tree, so it would be this great outdoor flexible space with picnic tables and things that the, uh, the, the students, or the, the, uh, I don't really know what you call the people in the daycare, but preschoolers, preschoolers can enjoy. So, 
And uh, Amanda, did I miss anything that you think we should cover or on any of these? No, I think you've covered everything on the outdoor spaces. Any questions on the outdoor spaces before we move into the building? Um, a quick question. Yes. And this is, you can show me a picture of <laughs> <laughs> So here on this one, in this picture right here, there's some hanging lights. Yeah, next to the outdoor. Yeah, right there. There's some hanging light. Is there going to be an opportunity to like have like seasonal hanging lights? Like maybe during the summer or something, we could keep them on in the evening so people could hang out there. Um, I don't know what that would look like. <clears throat> We haven't talked about it. I would love to have it. I've asked for it on this site and I wasn't able to get it. Um, but the, I, I'm assuming expense might be one of our biggest challenges there, but I think that's certainly some feedback we can take and um, potentially consider if the budget will allow. Um, I know one of our goals for our grant funding is gonna be focused on, on this outdoor space. We feel like that's our most likely um, candidate for Adams County Open Space Grant funding. Our intention is to apply for the fall cycle. Um, we've asked the team to really look at providing us kind of what's a base cost to do very little improvement in this um, lawn area compared to what we really want out there so that we can ask for that difference um, for, for a grant. We have a story that we can tell around that. Awesome, thank you. And then my other um, thing I wanted to just throw out there is I so you guys were just talking about the preschool play area which is going to be all the way by the rec center right um, and so if there is ever an opportunity for like play sculptures you know to be sprinkled in down the way um, closer to um, our community center drive as it gets closer that way um, I think that would be just yeah, I think that's something that we can definitely take into consideration as well. I think it would probably fit best in that, in kind of the outdoor park, the park spaces outside of the fence. Yes. Um, but yeah, that's definitely something we can take into consideration. Thank you. Um, this looks great. It's really exciting to see this come together. The only question I have is, have we thought about using, or the possibility of having different options of using this as a year-round space? I know it seems very much so, obviously, spring and summer. But the ability to have something with Noel North Glen to be able to to use it during the winter time or be able to have tents, that kind of thing when you talked about electricity, to make sure we're kind of thinking of the year-round perspective with this great amount of space that we have. I was like, we're in Colorado, so we can have days that are nicer in December than they are in February or in March or April sometimes. So we always take advantage <coughs> of our outdoor spaces during the during the off what we consider to be the off season for yeah. that. I don't think we have any intention for the permanent shelters or the ability to put necessarily heating out there, but will we activate that space when it makes sense? Absolutely. And the, one of the advantages of the movie, going from the two-way, separated two-way scheme that was in the master plan and moving the, making the two-way street, is that's moved all of those public spaces away from the any future buildings on the south side. Mm -hmm. And so that'll all get full sun throughout the winter months. And so it'll be really a pretty pleasant space uh, on most winter days. It's the last six weeks of sun. Let's, <laughs> let's assume that that's a, an aberration. So, and if, if I can walk, you know, we've got these really great 3D renderings, I think, that start to give you the character of the space. Uh, I don't know why they didn't show up on the slideshow, but the one. Let me try to see if I give it a minute on that slide, if it pops up. It does not. That does not leave it there. We'll see if it comes up, we'll look at it. The one on the left-hand side is a view down Memorial Parkway with the uh, two-way street with the angle parking, and you can see the, uh, the Veterans Memorial Plaza in the foreground with the flag and the sculpture, and you really get a good idea of what this uh, major uh, bike pen path is coming through down towards, and, and it all ends at the recreation center that you can see at the west end of the street, and so it's really a great public space. It's, I think it's a great civic setting, something we're really excited about. And, and then we've, uh, we've incorporated some of the architecture that was shown in the master plan. And so that's kind of that, uh, still maintaining that vision that was established in that document. Um, the upper right shows you the, a detail of the festival lawn with a portable stage and uh, the ability to host that concert there. You've got this great tree-lined space that you people will still be able to sit in the shade during a concert event if they would like. And then the lower right image is a detail of the entry to the recreation center, which is a pedestrian priority space 
where the street is actually raised up, so cars entering in that space, you know, to curb level, know that that's a pedestrian area, lots of people crossing, a lot of movement. We really want to make that a different environment, so it really uh, uh, gives that entry a, a real signature piece and something that all people feel comfortable moving into. And as, you, as you'll notice in that image, that, uh, that east-west major pedestrian fine, spine dead ends right into the front door of your building, so it's a really great access for non-motorized users. Anything else on the exterior of the building? Okay. So, so um, <clears throat> the uh, the building itself is laid out um, exactly as we've seen it before, and uh, what we what we looked at in feasibility study um, in terms of overall spaces, uh, rec, theater, senior, all uh, community rooms. Those are all all the general associations are, are where they were. Um, so no surprises there. Um, the things that we, we wanted to make sure that we included um, or that, that were goals of ours was to, was to make sure that we provided the same amenities that you have now, um, but obviously um, enhance user experience, easier to maintain, um, cost effective, and the biggest one was to provide this distinction between sort of all of the uses of the building, which you kind of don't have now. Everybody walks in the same uh, same front door, which is a cool experience. But I think the direction that we're headed is let's try and let's try and see if we can provide distinct experiences for the, for the different patrons. So, um, <clears throat> from a presentation perspective, we'll we'll go over sort of the overall building plans, uh, first and second floor first, and then we'll dive into uh, various zones of the building as we go along. So don't try and uh, squint your eyes at that plan quite yet. We'll have enlarged ones. Uh, as you probably see in your packet. Um, so just to relate you, um, if you're not uh, if you're not familiar, the building is two levels. Uh, the lower level, like this building where you enter council, is the rec center where you, you enter the rec center on the lower level and you enter the theater on the upper level. So don't get confused when you see the bottom of the theater and the lower level of the rec center. They're not they don't quite align on purpose. Okay, so. <clears throat> On the left of your screen are all the rec functions on uh, the lower level, and on the right of the screen uh, are the, the back of house theater functions because it is the lower level is not where you enter the theater. <coughs> the upper level, um, again, is the on the left is the uh, all of the upper level rec functions, and on the right is where you would enter the other side of the building, the south half of the building, where you get to the main entrance of the theater, community rooms, and senior center. Can you yes, go from one there to the is. other? Okay. Um, if you look down on the. Right there. Okay. Yeah, that connects uh, both sides on the, on the lower level, and then from there you'd have to progress up the stair elevator. Again, this is something that. In the narrative, you have the senior center the entrance at grade. Where is that on the first level that so, you're showing um, So the senior center is actually on the upper level, but on the upper level is at grade as well on the south side. Like the, the whole purpose of this was to put the senior center at grade level where they didn't have to go up and down. It is. So think about it like this building that we're in now. If you enter on up at the front entrance to City Hall, you're entering on the upper level of the building, but you're at grade. If you're entering on the lower level of the building, you're also entering at grade. So in this case, the senior center would be like entering up the front doors of City Hall, and you'd be right there. You don't have to go so up or down any stairs. On the second floor plan, where is the senior center? Uh, that's right there. So that is at grade, and there's accessible uh, parking at grade. It's actually right on the theater side. Yes, correct, correct. Any other questions about the basic overall plan? And you'll see that in a little more detail yeah. as we move forward here. You'll get to see a close-up of that space. Part of the thing to remember is like when you look outside um, when it's light out as you're coming in today, there's a slope on the property. So part of this grade dynamic is um, dealing with just the topography that we have to work with. So. Um, as you see the other iteration, it'll make more sense. 
And in fact, in this, in in the program of this building is actually pretty beneficial to have that layout because you want to come in, or you um, ideally you want to come in the theater at the upper and then progress down into it. So we're not having to build a big hole, big big hole, to to sink the theater down into the ground in order to make that happen. So it's that's actually added benefit. Um, so we'll move into sort of the various spaces now. We'll start on your left, where uh, which is the rec center. Um, in that box right there, you'll see the main entrance to the rec center. Um, so all rec users um, and all preschool uh, users um, come into the main entrance through a vestibule. Um, they're immediately greeted um, at the control desk by a, a customer service representative um, and sort of given um, sort of the where is and where at of the building. Um, the left to right hallway you see there is sort of the demarcation between what you pay for and what you don't have to pay for. So everything um, in front of the control desk, so we'll start here on the bottom left in poolside classrooms. Um, and they're labeled poolside classrooms, but they're, we're really thinking of, of them as multi-purpose rooms. Um, they can be, they're going to be outfitted more like a party room for rentals. Um, but you can do lifeguard training, you can have meetings, you can uh, run day camp uh, sessions in there. Um, there's not a limit to um, what you can use them for based on what the label says up there, so don't be afraid. Um, you have a good, a nice direct view from the lobby directly into the leisure pool to, to the left, which is the activity pool or water pool. And then above that is indoor play, which is which will house a, a play structure of some kind. And in addition to that, um, we've cordoned off a little space uh, right here in the corner to house uh, what we're calling a child watch function. Um, that gives uh, parents or grandparents or whomever it may be the ability to have their a short-term uh, child watch function so they can take a class or uh, go work out or go swim or do whatever they need to do um, in a safe environment uh, for their youngster. Um, so the way we're thinking about it again is uh, all the functions that are available to the public without paying are above. So you also see that there's sort of a little living room seating uh, environment there and uh, computers uh, for public use much like you have now. Um, what we are, uh, what we take pride in here on this control desk is um, it's sitting there right at the front. You see, you immediate, patients immediately come in the building and they're greeted by somebody standing there saying hi. It also gives, uh, from an operational standpoint, it gives them the ability to see and hear sort of all the way down all these hallways uh, that lead you to the major functions. Um, so to the right and off the screen, and what we'll get to next, um, it, you'll, see, you'll be able to see down the preschool. Um, you can see the main entrance. You can see sort of behind you that where it leads you to all the recreation functions, and you can still see indoor play and poolside classrooms. Um, so it gives you this, uh, a good view of everything to, to um, keep track of what's going on in the building um, so no one can, can sneak in or out. Um, so moving forward, uh, a little view of what uh, that starts to shape up like. And we're in a very early design phase, so everything is square and blocky and doesn't quite have all the structure it needs to have yet, so forgive us for that. But this would be your experience as you come into the lobby. Um, this down here on the bottom would be your control desk. Uh, you'd, again, you'd see down into the leisure pool, and when we get to upstairs, you'd start to see the, the fitness functions, treadmills, stair climbers, and all those things would be upstairs overlooking uh, the lobby space. Um, right here is sort of the pinch point of control. So once you move past that point, you're paying a play. Um, whether that be individual or pass or punch card or whatever it may be, um, that's where you access the pool. Uh, that's where you get to go upstairs and, and get to go to the aerobics rooms or, or the fitness area. Um, so moving over a little bit to the plan right, we're gonna go into the preschool. And again, this is still pre-control area. Um, we're looking at this as two separate licensed preschool programs, um, and they each have their own uh, restroom. Uh, they share, uh, unlike what you have now where your preschools are on different sides of the buildings, 
Uh, right now, we're, we've uh, associated them close together so they can share facility, share storage, share control, share all the functions that hopefully we don't want to, we're trying not to double all these spaces uh, because we think they're, um, they can work for both um, by, by putting them together. Uh, moving up in, in the plan uh, is where you get access to the patio with the benches and then eventually to the tot lot that Paul described um, as sort of off to the right there. Uh, something I, I, forgot, I neglected to mention here on the lobby, uh, there will be a single accommodation unisex restroom uh, available to the public in the lobby or any of the, uh, any of the lobby associated spaces uh, there as well. Okay. I mean, you asked about the access to the uh, theater side. If you keep going down this hallway through those doors, you can go straight into the sort of back of house of the theater. Uh, so moving on, uh, we'll approach the plan on the lower level of the rec center from left to right. Uh, so we'll start with water. Uh, so the, we're looking at two bodies of water that are um, separate environments. Um, the first one at the top here is the leisure pool or activity pool. Um, it's a warm water pool. It's about 80, 86, 80 degrees constant. Um, the depth varies from zero to four and a half feet, but a majority of the pool depth is about three and a half. It allows for the most flexibility for programming and functions and, and play uh, for, for most adults. Um, I'll walk you through. So coming out of, uh, we haven't got to the locker rooms yet, but when you come out of the locker rooms, uh, we want to give you, the first thing you hit is shallow water, because we don't want kids running out and dumping themselves into the lazy river. So at this zero depth side uh, is where we have programmed for uh, the younger kids. So there's geysers, uh, there's a small, you know, maybe small children's water slide and other play features that uh, we still need to investigate. Uh, but that's the sort of activities that would happen there. And moving into the sort of social zone here, um, you'll see that there's stairs into it as well if you want to avoid the zero depth entry, but it has benches on both sides and the ability for um, older kids, um, toddlers per se, to, to play when they're not in the baby area, quote unquote, as my son likes to say. Um, and moving past that into the Lazy River, um, I think you all have experienced uh, a Lazy River. Um, it has the ability to, um, the, the speed and power has the ability to adjust up and down so the lifeguards would be able to provide, you know, a fast ride or a slow ride that seniors could walk against uh, for fitness purposes, etc. cetera. Um, we've chosen um, to save sort of some deck space and maybe operational issues that this is a, a walking slide, so it's not an inner tube slide. You don't get in anything, um, so you don't have to storm, but it's comfortable for two people to walk next to each other if you're, if you're doing that social activity uh, there. And, um, Moving to the left, uh, where it says warm water jetted seating, uh, one of the highest sort of priorities that we heard, um, but weren't a, unfortunately we're not able to provide, um, is a spa. So one way we were able to get that in this body of water was uh, to provide sort of a very spa-like environment in this zone with warm water jets in it. Now it's not a separate body of water, it's not going to be in the 100 degree range, but it, it is um, hopefully a feature that those who requested it would, will enjoy as well. Um, and then moving over here, um, we're looking at a body slide, a water slide that comes out of the building and you ride down and slide down into a, um, its own run out as well. Okay. And then... Um, oh, I think we have oh, a couple questions. Sorry. I just want to ask a question. So I'm wondering, um, when you say we can't provide spa, hot tub, whatever. Yeah. If the residents wanted one, mm -hmm. is there a reason we can't provide it? So the biggest challenge is when we went through the concept plan, it was somewhere in the middle. So it wasn't at the top during the concept planning stage. And so it did fall off based on price um, and space and maintenance. Um, all of which were high for that particular amenity. So it fell off during that concept level phase. However, after concept was done, I kept getting calls from residents. <laughs> and so that was where I went back to the team and said, is there any way we can do it? And the aquatics uh, consult subconsultant was like, came up and said, oh, I have a plan for you. And so what this allows for is it's still heated jets. 
it's still a separate area. It's just got an opening versus a, um, it's not entirely open to the rest of the pool. So it's a smaller, smaller, more protected opening. You can access it from the deck or from within the lazy river itself. Um, so keep some of that heat in there, but it also, from a maintenance per standpoint, um, should be much easier for us to maintain because you're not maintaining one really confined body of water at a at a high temp. We were talking on on some of the tours that we attended um, for other facilities. It was one of the things we just kept hearing over and over again was how much trouble maintenance is for their hot tub area um, and the number of times they have to completely drain all of that water. And it was regular. I, one of the facilities was doing it every few weeks. Um, they were completely draining it, cleaning it, refilling it. Um, so not only was it expensive, but they also have a lot of downtime um, as they're going through those processes. That's just helpful for us. We get asked questions about why, so thank you. Amanda, one of the things that came up at the Parks and Rec Advisory Board, particularly around the warm water jetted seating, was about accessibility um, and what that would be like for somebody who maybe has a tough time walking um, against a current in order to get into there. Do you want to share um, your thoughts and, and what response you provided to Parks and Rec? So I did let them know that we would provide that to Daniel, who I'm guessing is providing it to the aquatic sub. So I don't know that we have an answer to that quite yet. Um, one of the, I'm pointing at the screen as if you can see me. Um, let me point up here. So one of the thoughts was maybe it's possible to put that opening on off of the activities on leisure pool rather than the um, the lazy river. The other option is we do have the ability to change the speed at which that current flows. So turning that current on or off depending on the time of day and what made sense. So I think there's a couple ways we can deal with that, either operationally or um, architecturally. Sure. The, Does that um, help? Yeah, that's okay. great. Um, and then my second question is about the sun deck. I may be pushing projects together, so if this is incorrect, I hope you'll share that. I seem to remember the sun deck incorporating some play features as well for outdoor water. Is that correct? We did not include those in this. We had talked about some outdoor water features on Memorial Parkway, um, but uh, again, those seem to be lower on the priority list. We have the, from what we heard from the public, we have the small splash pad at EB Rains. Um, and so I believe at, at this point, we were not planning on including an additional splash ground at this location. Can I just clarify real quick? So in the zero depth area, you guys are still looking at play features, mm -hmm. yes. and would that include like a playground or whatever? Something buckets, maybe a slide, maybe some geysers, all the things that will be. Yeah, I think that when we get to the back, it's one of the things that we're going to have some oh, options okay. for and go out to the, the community and say, hey, what do you think uh, about these features? So, yes, it's yes, all yep. those things. My goal on that would be to select several things that would fit well within our budget, within the space, um, and then be able to put those out to the public either as theming or as individual features <coughs> that they'd like to see. Um, like I told, I've been telling staff, I promise they're not just little purple dots, but that's the placeholder for some sort of play, play feature yeah. or play structure. That particular one is a rod with three jumping buckets on it. Okay. So that's not the final one, but yes, there are absolutely play features in that set. Thank you. Two quick questions. What exactly is a social zone? And second question is, is warm, this warm water jetted seating, um, is there a pool in the area that has done this well or that we've see, we saw before? I just want, I don't want it to be confused with, we're no longer providing that hot tub feel, um, especially for our aging population, but that this is kind of what we replaced it with. There are um, jetted seating areas in the area, and I don't, I can't think of one off the top of my head, but those that we're talking about are yeah. simply seating areas. This one, the enhancement is warm water jets. Okay. So this is a, I don't, I can't think of one in the area at the moment. Yeah. I've never across with someone like that, so yeah. it's interesting. Um, and one thing uh, you asked about the social zone, so yeah. it's, it's really just the place where the parents hang out and let the kids play by them, the toddlers play by themselves. So the parents are socializing. Um, it's not, it's not the baby area. Um, I, I, I think you, I think sort of, it's not really. Um, I think maybe the name is 
misleading you, but it, it's it's sort of that three and a half foot level. Um, gotcha. I just didn't know if it was my inner team. Ben, it has benches on both sides. Yeah. That's where the social part comes in. <clears throat> but there's a place where you can park yourself and chat with a, a friend and watch the activities. I didn't know if it was my entertainment district and, and <laughs> my pool. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's also kind of um, yeah. the, yeah. So much the transitional area <laughs> where the zero depth, depth in, 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 in entry area is more for the toddlers and thing and kids of that age. And this is this is the area where, where kids are just beginning to have confidence to play a little bit more independently in, in water with their parents supervising, uh, but having maybe a little bit more distance. So imagine there's a couple of kids playing in the water, there's parents talking on the bench or, or just interacting. It's, it's more of an interaction space, even, even socially for, for kids. So our, our, our biggest challenge to your request of the potential of slime, sorry. No, thank you. Um, our biggest challenge um, with your request, and, and um, we'll figure out a way to accommodate this, of moving the, the jetted seating opening is to get to the activity zone is not the same depth as uh, the Lazy River. We really want that in the three and a half foot level so you're not, um, seniors don't feel like they're uh, in too deep of water. That activity zone is really designed um, for basic learn to swim programs, aqua aerobics. Uh, we'll have, uh, we're looking at a couple of basketball courts there potentially on the deck. Um, and what you don't see quite here is um, up there in that, in that area will also be the place where we have an accessible uh, lift that drops uh, a limited mobility folks down into the water as well if they, don't, if they choose not to use the, the zero depth entry uh, to gracefully enter into the water. One final question, is there a square footage breakdown of each of these spaces within this pool as of yet, or is it still open, kind of? Um, we can provide that. I think yeah. uh, part of it is uh, what we're also looking at, and this is still schematic design, so things are still moving a little, is what play features would go in there. And if we do move the jetted seating opening, that, that may change the Lazy River a little bit, but yeah, yeah. absolutely. I'd appreciate that, thank you. Sure. Um, moving on to the uh, the other pool, the square pool, six lane, uh, 25 yard pool. Um, the depth of this pool ranges uh, the shallow end from four feet all the way down to 10 feet. Um, it runs about 81 to 82 degrees, so it's a little cooler, uh, which allows for uh, the lap swimmers to be more comfortable. Um, in this pool, obviously, you can lap swim, but it's deep enough to, to do lifeguard training, uh, more advanced lap swimming, um, and all the other things that you would probably accommodate uh, more advanced uh, swimmers in your current uh, facility. Can I look diving? Can you dive? At the moment, we're not, uh, we're not planning for diving. Yeah. Um, what you, no. <laughs> Uh, what you see uh, on the left of the screen, screen are aquatics offices. You have them now, they're on the deck. Um, the aquatics offices that we're proposing here house uh, the lifeguard offices, um, the aquatics coordinator, and, and some place for the lifeguards to store their uh, personal belongings and change. Um, so it's, it's sort of a one-stop shop. Um, it views both pools, so while lifeguards are not guarding from the room. The doors are open, they can see what's happening. Um, that, that's the whole intent of sort of arranging it in, in that fashion. Can you stop diving? Can you ask about diving board or diving for swim team? No, diving board. Okay. Which is, well, I mean, a swim team, a swim team is two parts. The people who swim with the people dive. Yeah. So we would right. have a diving aspect of it. Okay, but will we have diving blocks for? We'll have starting blocks. Competition, yes. okay. Anything else on the pool? Can I just point out one of the things we haven't talked about yet? We've, I know Daniel's kind of pointed out the office spaces. Right now, most of our staff is either outside in a trail in one of the trailers or away from their program areas. So you're going to see both in this plan. Some of those, the staff who are directly responsible for a specific program area, we really tried to carve out spaces. I'm pointing at the screen again. Um, we really tried to carve out spaces that allow them to be where their staff are all the time. So the preschool coordinator, 
can be between those two classrooms. There's easy access there to what's going on with, with their programming. The aquatics coordinators in the pool area, still within a private office, a separate space, but right there easily accessible to, to their staff throughout the day. Um, so moving left of the plan, um, the locker rooms and restrooms there you see up on the screen. Um, so starting at the top and moving down, um, you have, uh, <coughs> excuse me, currently you have a couple of, uh, we call them cabanas, but they're, um, they're all inclusive, single accommodation, uh, shower, restroom facilities. So each of them have a shower, a toilet, a baby changing station, a bench, a sink. Uh, all the things that a family, a senior, a limited mobility uh, person may need to feel more comfortable that rather than using um, the, the traditional locker rooms would do. Uh, right now we're looking at, we have six of them, um, and outside of those spaces we'd have the larger, uh, more family-sized lockers as well. Uh, so moving down in the plan, um, you have we have each of the uh, individual sex restrooms um, with all the uh, standard trimmings, um, restrooms, locker rooms, sinks, uh, vanity counters, hair dryers, uh, and suit spinners uh, in both men's and women's. Um, and then right there in the middle, uh, we've also snuck in a uh, nursing room you know, with a sink and a bench that uh, we're looking at uh, providing uh, for staff and patrons as well. Um, we, we also kind of see that maybe um, depending on how programming works as a as possible use of a dry changing room as well. Good question. Uh, I asked this again, Amanda, at the Parks and Rec Advisory Board. Will there be ch um, children's or changing tables in the men's locker room? So we did yeah. clarify that yeah. with Daniel, and yes, I was, I was almost right. There are changing tables. It, my original response to that question was yes, of course. I know we were so close. Um, so it's in the men's and most of those downstairs um, bathroom facilities. The upstairs universal uh, log, uh, bathrooms by the fitness the rooms yeah. do not have changing tables identified just based on the way that space would likely be okay. used. Well, that's great. And thanks for including the nursing room. That's fantastic. Okay. Um, moving forward um, into right into the core of the building, there is a gym. Um, make no mistake about it. This is a this is a basketball gym. Uh, we're looking at a wood floor. Uh, what you see in color there are um, all of the proposed stripe layouts, and the dash line is the elevated track on the second level. Um, so what this is meant to, to show you is that you have the ability to do a single high school court uh, in the up and down direction on the screen there. Um, two middle schools going across, those are red, you know, the average shows up pretty good there, uh, with, a, with the ability to have a purple divider curtain, uh, exactly the same function as you have now. Uh, we will stripe it for a single volleyball court and four pickleball uh, running in the that was in the orange line to see here. Um, we are assuming that there will, even though you have community rooms, this gymnasium is larger in terms of space um, than the community rooms. So we are um, taking into account that some functions, uh, the, the bigger functions may happen in here, but we're not necessarily making any uh, upgrades or community room type um, uh, concessions to the gymnasium, if it's still going to feel and look like a gymnasium that would just allow you to have a larger <coughs> function. Can um, we go back to that one just really yeah, briefly? Um, just as a comparison point, this the gym, it's a gym, right? So it's, but it's pretty similar to what we currently have. The biggest differences are current cross courts, so those two cross court basketballs in, uh, in what color are they? Green. Right. Um, the green ones are, right now, we're at a cross-court elementary size. This brings us up to a cross-court middle school size. So the gym is, a, is wider than our current facility. It also adds seating area around at both ends, which currently, if you're sitting as a spectator, you, you kind of feel like you're in the game. Um, so this should give spectators some more room around the perimeter of the gym space. Um, so moving upstairs, uh, we'll stay on the fitness side of the building. 
Um, so moving into the fitness areas, uh, you saw the stairs uh, once you move past control. Uh, you hit the locker room, you drop off your stuff, you come up the stairs, uh, and you're sort of at this fitness platform. Uh, from there, um, you can hit, you can go to your uh, left and go around the walk jog track, which is within an gymnasium, or you can make a right and um, you'll be greeted by a staff member here at the desk. And as Amanda was describing, um, we're, tr we're trying to put a uh, staff member responsible for the area in their zone. So directly behind that uh, will be a, a rec coordinator who has an office upstairs who has, again, glass on the windows. They're not supposed to be, you know, uh, guarding, quote unquote, the fitness area, but they have a connection that maybe they don't have now. Um, so up on the upper half of the plan, uh, you saw where the lobby is. So the cardio uh, equipment, which is uh, stair climbers, um, um, treadmills, bikes, those types of equipment are on the upper half of the plan. Uh, they overlook uh, the leisure pool. And they're up there because we want uh, sort of, we want to give them a view down Memorial Parkway, A. And B, we want to put the weights, uh, the weights equipment, and those users and that's that type of noise which is uh, more impact noise rather than a constant noise down on the, uh, in the sort of I'm going to call it the back but it's not the back uh, the lower portion of, of the plan where they have a view west of the mountains uh, and overlook uh, sort of the fitness patio uh, what I skipped over uh, right here on the left side of the plan is a wellness room. Um, you don't have that function now. We hear these functions happen in the hallways of your building now. Um, but uh, that's one-on-one -on -one conversations with, um, with rec coordinators, uh, therapy, body fat assessment, um, all things that could happen in a room uh, with a little more privacy uh, for somebody to have a conversation or get that, get that attention. Uh, moving over to the right, um, the two fitness rooms that you see there, um, they probably say aerobics on your plan, uh, but those are really um, places where Zumba, yoga, um, even Tai Chi, spinning, all those, all those functions that you have now in the gym and the racquetball courts and all those things, those get moved to fitness rooms. Uh, and again, those are multifunction as well, uh, but they're just um, fitness-focused multifunction. Um, the two restrooms that you see in the middle are um, single accommodation, they're universal. These are the two that we think normally wouldn't provide baby changing stations in because babies probably aren't up there, probably. Um, but uh, there's a big storage room right there in the middle that the, um, the fitness rooms store uh, for all the balls and bikes and ropes and all the things that you need for classes. Um, as you walk around the walk jog track, we like to use the uh, corners of the gym uh, for opportunities for stretching, plyometrics, um, medicine balls, all those types of things can happen in those ancillary spaces. Um, so we want to make sure we preserve those. Uh, the one in the bottom left corner there, obviously we have to leave open for exiting, but um, we're looking into making sure the rest are usable as well. Um, so a little view, uh, once you get to the top of that fitness platform and you look back, you can see, um, you can start to see where the exterior design um, is going. And we have, um, you have these fit this fitness equipment on the upper level, uh, potentially looking out over Memorial Parkway, and uh, which you can't see on, on the left of the screen there, is they'll, they'll have these in the leisure pool, and it'll be light and bright and airy. And, not on the first floor and not with these short ceilings that you got now. Um, so we hope it's a, a vast improvement over uh, your current user experience. Um, so moving on to the other side of the building, uh, we're calling it the Senior Community Wing, uh, which is really also the theater. Um, but now we're moving into sort of the second level. So we'll start at the top and then move down when we get to the theater uh, back at house spaces. Um, so the main entrance is over here in this red arrow on the right. It is at grade. Um, sorry, we didn't explain that very well. Um, and what you see here um, in, in trying to provide this sort of separate experience uh, for, there are three functions really on this side that we're seeing. Um, the senior at the top, the theater in the middle, and the community at the bottom. 
Um, so when you enter the vestibule, uh, we're, we're very interested in seeing how this develops in the design, but clear signage to, to take you to the place you need to be immediately, not wander through the building and try and find somebody. Um, but that is, that's, that's part of the experience of coming to uh, this type of building. It's got a bunch of functions, but you should be able to get there easy. So, um, if you, again, if you go up, you'll hit the senior lounge. If you go straight in, um, you'll get to the theater lobby. And if you go down, um, we have sort of a, a community room, a small lobby or pre-function space uh, for that zone down there. Um, what you see here, uh, which you won't uh, see in future slides, is we ha we've uh, carved out a little space for somebody to sit. In the event that there's a community room function happening, and there's three functions happening and the rooms are divided, somebody's got to be over there to tell somebody, go to room A. So that's, uh, that's the attendant or uh, customer service uh, representative. That's the spot for them to uh, greet your patrons as they come in. Um, and here's a, just a little view of, of uh, where, we're, uh, where we're at and looking from uh, the community room side across the lobby uh, to your right would be the main entrance. Uh, the doors that you see here are uh, the entrance to the senior, uh, sort of senior wing. And, and to your left would be the box office and bar functions that go along with the theater. Do you have a question? I was going to hold it, but so on the senior side, yeah. equating myself to the parking. Yes. The parking is really that 103 that opens later way on the other side. Correct. So distance-wise, what would you say the distance is from the parking for them to walk to the senior side? If you go back to that slide, it's actually right. Yes. So that purple is right adjacent to the senior center. That bottom right corner is the senior center. Yeah. So so not on the other side. The parking is uh, right here. Got it. And the enter and you it's not upstairs. It's not across an icy, uh, you know, lake bed like it is now. Um, you don't have to cross the Christmas light wires. So we got all that. And, and you can kind of see the outline of the curb line there. That's where the handicap spaces are. Uh, on the north end of the soft lot adjacent to the building. And kind of, uh, some of those spaces would be signed for senior. Uh, so you have the handicap spaces and then the remaining spaces would be signed for seniors. Um, so moving on, uh, now we're going to look at, uh, we're going to start at the plan on the bottom and go to the community rooms. Uh, so this is the layout for the multi-purpose community rooms at the moment. Um, it, it has the ability to be split into three. Um, if you take, if you retract all of the operable partitions, uh, max capacity is at 240 right now at uh, 10 top tables, so round tables with 10 seats. Um, each of the uh, rooms separately have their own storage room, um, and they have access to a patio, an outdoor patio down on the bottom of the plane. Uh, to the right is the catering kitchen. Um, it's a step up of, from what you have now, but it still offers the same uh, sort of service counter abilities that you do now, and I, I want you to... Um, think about these as sort of, right now you have them in the senior center. Um, so they're very much the same function, but they're not in the senior center anymore. And in addition to that, um, seniors can use this side. They're right across the lobby. So, um, you know, when they have food servers or when they have a bigger Tai Chi class or things like that, um, I think we're talking about the ability to give them uh, some of these functions um, in this zone as well. We've really talked about this space as being integral to the senior center during the day, but it's not that dedicated space. The senior lounge and the senior activity room are the dedicated senior or older active adult spaces. Um, during the day, we really even see some fitness, our senior fitness class, our lower impact senior fitness classes, taking place in these multi-purpose community rooms. One of the things we heard over and over again was, yes, we don't want to be on the second floor, but they also don't even want to be crossing paths with the preschoolers. <laughs> um, and so the same kind of applies to some of, to the active use gym and 
those things that are happening. And so if you're a senior that doesn't feel as stable on your feet, you don't feel like if somebody darts in front of you that that's going to impact your balance or your ability to move safely through the space, those are kind of the types of classes that are more likely to happen in this space instead of in a fitness room or, um, or on the more active side of the facility. So a quick question about the um, community rooms. Is there, um, have you guys thought about putting like projectors, like screens that come down from the ceiling and stuff in yes. case somebody wanted to have like a class there? Yes. Okay. So we did meet, we have a, we did have an AV conversation already. Our intention would be that all three spaces are outfitted along with the fitness rooms. Um, and we've talked about perspective of sound and um, visual projection. Awesome. Yeah. Um, down on the bottom, uh, sort of in black or dark gray, there is an exterior loading zone for the kitchen. So um, if you do have a catering event, you have somebody bringing food. Uh, drive up, have exterior access to the kitchen, um, and you also see that if if in the event that that rightmost room is rented and you need the kitchen, you still have the ability to walk around to get to the kitchen, so it's available to the other two rooms or some combination thereof. Um, also, the stairs that you see there lead you down to the first floor. Uh, there are an exit stair. Uh, they take you down to the back of the house theater area. Um, now moving um, across the lobby into the office or admin spaces, um, we've centralized, um, minus the various functions that we've placed around the building where they belong um, in that zone, we've centralized uh, sort of the core uh, admin people um, into one area so they're not sitting around in various parts of the building. Um, part of that is to increase productivity, conversations, um, teaming, all those things, and it's also to re re uh, reduce repetitive equipment. You know, we don't have these little printers sitting all over the place um, in the building, and it gives you, it gives them the ability to have uh, sort of their own conference room and their own break area and their own workspace um, to get things done that they need to get done, um, and they're not spread out. Um, you'll see we have a, a handful of private offices. Each of them have. Uh, uh, we're looking at them to be shared at the moment. Um, they'll be shared with the same type of function. Um, so I, I can't remember. This is primarily our supervisory staff as well as our staff who aren't assigned to a specific area. So our sports staff, they're kind of all over the place. They're out at fields, they're utilizing the gym. There's not really a space that makes sense for them to be in the building. They would come to this space to work. It also provides a workspace for staff who do have some of the smaller private offices that are divided amongst the building to come together and work on something. So there's shared workstations, as, as Daniel mentioned, um, for those part-time staff to have a spot where they may not have a computer or anything dedicated to them in the space they're working in, but they have a space that they can come to to use a computer, have a meeting, sit down with staff. So a quick question on that note, is there any Parks and Rec staff that are in City Hall that would move over there? That we do not um, intend to. The only Parks and Rec staff I have in City Hall right now is my Parks Project Manager, um, and she doesn't isn't specific to a recreation function, and okay. our Administrative Assistant, okay. and myself. Something we did miss uh, when we were downstairs, directly behind the control desk, there will be a little workroom there as well, mm -hmm. uh, copy and printer, mailboxes. Um, a workstation for people to check in when they first come to work, etc. So there will be backup uh, in an enclosed room, very much like you have now, uh, behind that control desk uh, to backfill in when uh, you peak in usage. It says very much like we have now. Right now we have a little triangle. But He's good. promised me it's not a triangle. Yeah. <laughs> circle. Everything's a circle. Um, so moving over to plan right, um, we're, we'll look um, at the senior area. And um, at the bottom of the plan there, you see the double doors that come in from the vestibule. So they have their own sort of entrance into their area where they enter into the senior lounge. Um, there's a private office with a reception desk in front of it. Again, much like the configuration you're used to at the moment, um, but all triangles. Um, that senior lounge uh, is really sort of the living room. It's the library, it's where you get coffee, um, it's going to have, you know, we're thinking of it as slower, comfier, things like that. And then the multi-activity space is really multi-purpose. Um, so Tai Chi, card room, silver sneakers, all those types of function have, 
functions happen um, in that multi-activity space. And then keep moving up in the plan, uh, exterior patio, uh, again, that this is all level, uh, so we're not changing grades. So even when you go outside, there's a flat area. You can't, it, you, it would take steps to get up to from the sidewalk, but it, once you're in the building, it's all flat uh, to get to an exterior patio where we may have um, you know, a lunch table or, or other functions that, that people may want to enjoy the outside <coughs> for as well. Uh, multi activity Can you compare the existing senior area where they have the kitchen and where they do activities to what this size is on this activity? Sure, you can. Um, it's the. It, there's an illusion because of the kitchen in the middle and that big wide sort of circulation right. zone. Um, so it, the, if, if we just took those two sort of saddlebag rooms and put them together, they're pretty close. I, I believe this, this room is maybe a touch smaller if you put them together, but they're, they're pretty close. Um, we do have with the intention that we, we really expand that space with those communi that community room that allows us to do something like a large senior luncheon where right now I it think some a lot of you have spoken on a microphone up in the senior center and you don't know which side to talk to or where to not walk in front of um, so that you get that lovely screech from the sound system. Um, so those types of activities I really see happening in those community in that community room where there's really good <coughs> access to the kitchen and the serving counter and good circulation around that space um, rather than in this activity area. Thank you. Um, and this does have a nice big. Uh, rectangular storage room um, that right now you're dealing with sort of that all along the wall that's like three feet deep or something you know? so, um, so uh, it does have that added benefit as well. Can I ask, what is the office below the storage room? Whose office is that? So that's the theater office. That's the theater office. So because our at least in our, in our current configuration, uh, the recreations, there's a recreation supervisor who oversees both theater and the senior center. So that would put that person accessible to both of those functions. And even in the event that that were to change at some point down the road, it's not planned for right now, but if, if that were to change, it would still um, lend itself well to supervision of that theater space. Mm -hmm. Um, if there's no questions about community or senior or the lobby itself, I'd like to turn it over to Chris from Simple Brown. Uh, he's our partner on the theater side. Great. Hi, Chris. Thanks. Hey, Amanda. Hello, everyone. Um, some kind of thematic things that I'd like to talk about in terms of the design of the theater. As, as Daniel indicated, it's basically in the same location, and it's still working really hard to achieve some of those initial goals that staff gave us in terms of enable the theater audience to feel like they've come someplace special, someplace that's not in the middle of you know fitness classes and those kinds of things, and enable the operations of the theater in terms of the fact that you have got so many com community participants who are young kids and families and that sort of thing to be better managed and feel more secure those are things that we feel great about. We've also been working um, to help your staff feel like they're getting a more functional facility. And I'm gonna talk about that in terms of diversity of programming, frequency of use, and the way that they're getting synergy with the rest of the building, okay? Uh, so as Daniel walked you through all of this, you'll see that this is all very similar. I'm gonna stand up because my behind is sore, sorry. Um, so at the upper floor level where we're getting the lobby and the entrance uh, that's pointed out to you over here. Uh, which one does that? The top. Top, right. the very top. Top right. There we go. So as we come right in here, we're orienting you from the parking through these doors directly to the box office. So the first thing you should hit are the faces of friendly people who have tickets for you and an orientation for you and that kind of thing. There's a, there's a bar immediately next to that and an office to manage uh, the ticket sales and front of house operations. Sorry, we can move into a detail. Paul, I just got your winter whiteout rendering. 
on the screen. I'm going to blame you for that. So um, I even checked him on my computer, but yeah, I didn't come so, check him on this one. Um, let me just go back for a second and say then then you have a choice of entering on the right hand side or the left hand side of the theater at the upper level. As we described, because of the slope of the site, the theater is at grade at both levels and we're taking advantage of the slope of the site for the slope of the seating itself. So you enter straight in on a flat floor to the upper level of the theater and just inside the doors is a much larger technical control area for sound, lighting, and projection, those kinds of things. Um, restrooms, of course, are up here shared with senior activity and uh, the community room. And we'll go ahead and go to the lower level. So at the lower level, where the stage is, we create a very complete and contained backstage zone. So we have deliveries of materials and scenery and supplies straight to the scene shop at our loading dock here. We also get deliveries of participants, kids who are performing, kids who are working on stage crew, family members, that kind of thing, who come immediately inside and are seen by people in one of two offices. We have a rehearsal room. This is a significant piece of territory that you don't have now. So one of the things that we're working on in terms of functionality is not pushing all the rehearsals onto the stage. It frees up the stage for more performance days. So this is a rehearsal room for both classes and rehearsals. Has its own storage area. Has a costume shop and storage area immediately off this hallway that surrounds the theater. Since we're still in the back of house zone, we've got two what I'll call solo dressing rooms. Some people would say star dressing rooms. Some people would say guest artist dressing rooms. Could also be a conductor space if you've got a, a music ensemble or something like that and those have showers and uh, makeup spaces so they can also function as universal or gender neutral dressing spaces. We've got some backstage restrooms, a green room, and from the green room or performer lounge, you go into one of two identical dressing rooms. So within that whole area, we're keeping everybody close together, under supervision, nobody's having to wander off into the rest of the building to get to a restroom or a rehearsal space or anything like that. Once you step out of the door here, you're back in the public zone because this side of the space, of the floor, is where patrons can come down because the theater is split with a cross aisle right here in the middle. So a stair comes down and an elevator comes down from the main lobby to reach that point. And off that lower level lobby, we've got a universal dressing, or sorry, restroom for patrons here. And then this is the hallway that connects you to the rec center side of the building. Okay? So materials that arrive and get fabricated into scenery happen in the scene shop, and then there's a direct path directly onto the stage. Some of the other nice things that we've been able to do in terms of the functionality of the stage itself are to make it kind of like your offices, no triangles involved. Um, so the corners of this stage don't narrow down as the current corners of the stage of your theater do. Um, we have a little more wing space here. Uh, and then we have dedicated territory here in the what we call the four stage, right out toward the audience to create an orchestra pit in this zone and then we slope up the lower portion of seating is on a continuously sloping slab because we're creating an accessible path to get down to the orchestra pit area and then once you're in the upper area it slopes up more steeply to give you a beneficial sight line for that so when we look at the blow up of the theater seating here's that lower section we are providing four of our required ADA seating locations directly off of that cross aisle so that you get an unobstructed view to the stage. And two of them are up at the top. Again, up at that higher seating level, you may feel like you want to step back a little bit. Um, but the cross aisle from side to side really gives us that benefit. And in the rear corners of the house or the audience chamber, 
are where we have not only a sound and light lock, so that when some an audience member arrives late, opens the door, you don't get this flash of light into the theater, so the noise from the lobby also stays out, are also ladders up to follow spot platforms. So up above the audience level, we've got catwalks that extend across the sides and across the center. So currently, right now, there's no way for a technician, particularly someone learning lighting, to get to your lighting position over the audience except by climbing up a ladder. This is a much safer way to instruct theater lighting, especially with kids, and provides us with the location for follow spot platforms at the rear of, this, of the house. So what that looks like in section, if we cut a slice through the room, is that from the lobby, you come in past the box office to those vestibules. Up above are the follow spot platforms. The catwalk extending forward to our front of house lighting position. There's the 45 degree angle that a lighting designer really wants to have. And this is the recess into which the platforms from the four stage can be lowered to create an orchestra semi pit that you don't currently have. Here are some views three dimensionally inside. So you can see that there will be uh, not just, sorry, the theater seats themselves. There's the front section of seating at the lower slope and the higher slope in the rear. We put the aisles in the rear on the sides because that's helpful both from a sightline standpoint, it pulls the seats away from the far wall and it's better acoustically. And then you can see that when you come in the door here from the cross aisle on both sides, you can circulate on a flat floor to get to the stage. So if you've got civic presentations, award ceremonies, that kind of thing, or if you're a really imaginative theater director, you can actually stage performers coming into the room here and making their way onto the stage. Viewed from up in the rear accessible seating position, you can see how unobstructed your view is. Here are additional accessible seating locations. Here's our walkway to the stage, and there's the recessed orchestra pit area. Any questions about that? Happy to go back to Can you go back to the stairways? Sure. So one of the, my challenges in life as I get older, <coughs> and because of my disability, <coughs> when I go to activities mm -hmm. and they have stairways with no handrails, it's very difficult, and I see handrails there. Yep. <clears throat> but is that possible to make it stairway and ramp? Because it's a lot easier for someone who has limited uh, mobility to walk a ramp than it is to walk stairs. Sure, so, so I should be, I want to make sure that I understand you clearly about the combination of stairway and ramp. So in the lower seating section, that's right, entirely no ramp. There's no stairs there. Right? No stairs there at all. Right. But in, this, in the other one. Up here. <coughs> right. Correct. I'm not permitted to build a ramp that steep. We're just we're just climbing at too fast a rate to enable any of that, that to be rate. rammed. Yeah. Yeah. But because of the layout of seating there, it is possible for a patron to get to either <coughs> seats at this level or at the top here by only going down one step, actually to seats without going down any steps at all. So there's a choice of sitting more toward the rear or closer to the front without navigating any steps. A guy like me would want to sit right in the middle. Yeah, so you would come in down this, down the elevator from the main lobby through the cross aisle and have your choice of seats right to left in that entire row. <coughs> and the, <coughs> the steps side will not be like, like it is in normal homes or I mean right. be two feet or better. Yeah, so they're gonna be they're gonna be wider, you're gonna have a handrail on the side and you're gonna have lighting. Okay, the other, my other question is <coughs> if you had to evacuate this theater mm -hmm. quickly, where would the exits be? Sure. So your exits would be most most people are going to, I'm going to go back to here. So that's a good one. Most people 
will come in through one of these two doors, so psychologically they'll turn around and go out that way to the lobby. We're also going to have the ability for all of those people to exit out one side or the other from the cross aisle. So in the case of, sorry, in the case of these folks, when they exit out of here, they can- Think of more of emergency evacuation rather than exiting. Sure, sure. But, but you've, got, you've got four public exits from a 340 person theater, way more than we need, are required to have. And the pathway from this side is directly out to the loading dock and performer entrance. The pathway from this side without using any stairs is straight out to the main entrance of the rec center and or out this way past the play area of the preschool. Okay, happy to take a look at that. I mean, if it's a panic situation, everybody who's in the middle is going to want to go up or down. Right. And, who, you know, people don't think that way. They look at an exit sign and head for it. Yeah, yeah, so that's that's why we're so focused that, that these two, so the two exits on either side of the theater at this at this lower level, instead of being, I mean, What's common with some cinemas is you put them here, but that gets confusing because of stage access and going on the stage. So by placing them here, we've only got, we've got you know 125 or 30 people down here in the lower level splitting to two sides. I'm basically emptying 60 to either side. It, it'll happen pretty quickly. One other challenge that we're- That's my input. Yep, thank you. I was just going to add, and that's also something that we'll continue to get the North Metro Fire Rescue District's input on as well. They've done an initial look at the preliminary plan, but we can certainly bring that up to them for some additional feedback. Sure. Yep. One of the challenges on that lower level as we are, oh, much of it well, is... <clears throat> in this corner, you could really have two exits. You could add two additional exits. Um, okay. In these two corners here. Um, I, I see what you mean. I mean, I'm certainly happy to look at those. In, in the case of all of these folks, that would, that, would, that would require them to go, because they can't step up to that corner, that's, that's going to be a 30-inch jump. So they, they have to go up the ramp, into the cross aisle, they'd have to make a 180 degree turn in order to make it. Well, the way it's designed now, but if it's designed it differently, then it could be an exit. I understand that. I've also got a code requirement for ADA to provide an accessible path to the stage. So that, that's what that flat area is doing. <clears throat> So we can definitely look yeah, at yeah, we can look yeah. at both of those and how yeah. those balance with you know, code ADA requirements. Is a minimum requirement. Our goal is always going to be to <clears> try to find a handicapped parking space anywhere. Sure. In any place that does business, because they put the minimum. They don't put what they need. They put the minimum. Sure. Yeah. So the same thing here. Yeah. We're putting the minimum. I would I would argue that by bringing an accessible toilet down to that cross aisle level, we're going beyond the minimum. And we could we could engage in that argument. Yeah. Okay. Other questions? So um, we'll move uh, to the outside of the building, um, which uh, we made a few updates. Um, so what we heard from the community is um, we don't want a barn, and you don't want a big shiny red whale, right? So we're trying to meet you somewhere in the middle. And um, what we've done is taken uh, what the initial design of the feasibility study was and maybe took one click towards a little more modern uh, than what you saw previously. Uh, but what we were trying to address here is um, the unique opportunity that we have with this building. Um, it's the first thing of a big master plan. It's North Glen's future. It's, um, it, it really acts as uh, a building with sort of two speeds. 
you know, you have this, you have this glimpse of it as you go past on I-25 and how your eye reacts to that going north and going south versus the slow, calm, pedestrian scale uh, where you interact with it in the front. Um, so what we wanted to do is create some way that, or shape, um, uh, that we can integrate into the design that would be easily distinguishable on all the sides where you would interact with it. On the north side, you're coming in from the detention pond. Um, we, we did not address that side, but the main entrance, what you see uh, when you head down Memorial Parkway uh, is the rec center entrance, which you have, which you see up there. Uh, what we kept is sort of this iconic uh, gable end shape uh, that you'll see in, in the next uh, few slides that show up as when I'm driving past on I-25, and you see this building, and it has its its um, it has a quick shape on it. When you come around the other side, you'll see this entrance, and you say, oh, "Okay, I get it. That's the same building, but it's at a different scale. It's got different design features because it's on the other side. It addresses the community. It's it's going a little slower." Um, so we've updated it uh, to what you see here. And uh, right here in the middle is the main lobby that we saw before. Uh, you see the glass where the fitness uh, uh, deck or the second level looks out. Um, it also gets a nice light coming in. Uh, sun deck over here on your right with the, um, with the water slide uh, coming out of the building, interacting with the space, and then uh, diving back into the building. Um, there's a there's a few there will be a drop off that you saw um, in Paul's site plan right at the front. Uh, so you come up at grade. It's all level. You can drop off and and keep moving on to parking. Um, moving on to the theater side again, keeping in in line with uh, sort of different experiences, but having a, a similar feel. Um, you still see this sort of iconic shape on the side, but it's lower. It's a different. It's a. It's got different materials. Um, it's it's sort of a higher level of finish, um, and you don't see as much of the pop of colors as you do on the rec side, purposefully, because it should be a different experience. It should be slower. It should be um, a little lower, and it should be a higher end feel. Um, so a couple of views of what that theater entrance may look like. And uh, some of the most exciting things that we're exploring at the moment, which there's only a a view of the theater entrance at the moment, but it could be explored on the rec side, is the idea of lighting this entrance um, to reflect the feel of what's happening, whether it's uh, the holidays, or whether it's a certain show, or whether it's the 4th of July. All these things can sort of be accommodated, um, maybe with the feel of the lighting, as well as being able to see um, through and what's happening on the inside. Um, one interesting thing we're working on with the Arts Council, so the North Carolina Arts and Humanities Foundation, you, Foundation. is submitting um, a grant application through SCFD. We've really looked at what you see right now is kind of the little sparkly thing up in the center. Um, we are trying to figure out how we can do a sculptural lighting fixture, fix, yeah, a sculptural lighting fixture. I say that three times fast um, in that space. So a pretty significant identifiable piece that you can see from both outside and inside the building. Um, those app, that application is being turned in here within the next week or so, week or two, um, and we will know later this year the status of that funding. Um, we are still identifying funds within the project budget for basic lighting fixtures, um, but if we can upgrade that to a sculptural piece, we think that really can make an impact and help identify that space. Something we are um, also keeping in mind is we want to we want to be good neighbors. We want to be visible, but good neighbors. Um, we don't want bright spotlights, big signs, all these things facing directly towards the apartment building, because um, that will get annoying very fast. Um, but you also can't, uh, once the sound wall ends, you don't really have a view of this side if you're sort of moving, unless you're dead stopped. Um, you shouldn't, at speed, you shouldn't be able to look long enough to your right to see the entrance of the building. You're probably moving faster than you really should be focusing on. <laughs> so um, we're really addressing um, sort of, again, that this 
the function that you're where when you get there, uh, and not in, at this in this side of the building, not addressing the <coughs> fast and that and that glimpse because you don't feel like you're you're there's value added there in terms of uh, what North Glen is, is showing the world. Um, so, yeah. So I remember in a previous conversation we talked about a marquee of some sort, and where, what was what I think that? That's sort of what Daniel was just alluding to. We had talked about that as being kind of in front of this space, and really the more we looked at it with the constraints of the site and how far the sound wall comes out, it just didn't make sense to put that amount of light on that side of the building for the view that you would get. We'd be marketing really mostly to the apartment complex, um, which didn't necessarily make sense. Mm -hmm. And are we doing any marketing on um, the west side, looking yeah, at the west side? Yeah. Um, I'll get right to it. Is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. Um, so right now we're looking at um, a multitude of different options for um, building uh, <coughs> materials. So don't get caught on uh, caught uh, looking at exactly what brown and uh, what green. Um, yeah, we, we like the colors. However, uh, we want to make we want to look at durability. We want to look at cost. We want to look at maintenance. Um, and test them against um, all the sort of constraints of the project and make sure we're selecting the right thing for this project. Um, so what you see on um, the theater entrance side um, is, uh, again, lower scale, maybe a different take on the North Gun logo that's not quite as colorful but clearly distinguishable with the N and the uh, tree, uh, which is different from what would be maybe on the um, uh, a west side of the building, which is what you're looking at there. Um, as you pass by on I-25, you notice um, sort of all the lower parts of the building are fairly um, fairly benign because you're really kind of looking up. And so the logo's up high, the fitness deck is up high. You start to see that iconic shape that we talked about for the other entrances. Um, and we'll start to look at how, uh, what design features we can provide on that upper level uh, at that fast moving speed. And I would assume they'll start to see things like um, signage on the building identifying names mm -hmm. through the design development sure. phase. So that piece isn't quite there yet. Okay. So what animal shape? Sky. <laughs> I haven't looked, but we do have a, a <laughs> just wondering. threshold to uphold there. So, can you make it into an eagle? Uh, How about a bear? Possibly. possibly. A bear. I can do a seal. <laughs> um, so that's all we have on from the exterior of the building. Are there any questions there before I move to this last quick slide? Please. Just a comment. I think. For me, with the senior center, it's just a little, um, I don't like that there's not a separate entrance because it kind of looks like there's a separate senior center when you're looking at it in the theater. Uh -huh. um, I think that may be confusing for some people and I know that down the line, once everybody knows that you have to enter through the theater, that that's taken care of. So I get that part, but it just, just to look at it from that view, um, it just looks like there should be a door and can they get in from that patio? Can they enter the senior center from that outdoor patio? Technically, there's a door there, and it would need to be it would be required to be unlocked. Um, and whether or not programmatically we allow um, <coughs> you, you would allow that or not would be would be up to you to know what functions are happening. Um, but yes, there is a door. I think it's something we can look at. I think some of the potential challenges are just try to make sure that we meet all those exiting and entering requirements based on the size of the space. Do we have to have a vestibule there? Does that create a loss of space? If we can achieve it without a loss of space, I would be in favor of trying to incorporate a door directly from that. It just looks like its own little separate space there, senior center, and but yet you can't enter there. You have to go around. Yeah. Not a big deal. I get it. But um, it just seems like there should be a door. I think it's something we can look at. Yeah. Absolutely. Further? Yeah, I can see the signage will help, I think, too. We're still exploring right. enough above and a bunch of different options for where it says senior center, where it says theater. And I think we can hopefully tackle that, you know, clear up some of that confusion with some of the signage. Thank you. Yeah, I, I agree with the mayor. I think that that would be awesome to, to have that separate entrance if it's an option. Um, so people look to and so I'd like to see what the mayor is look at. But as we talk
talked about the building. I wondered if you're anticipating an increase in FTE to staff all those. We are. So okay. when we did the concept phase, part of that was the staffing assessment. Um, and so that's certainly something we'll be bringing back to you here as we get a little closer. Um, we really started phasing in little pieces of that this year as we moved a few people from part-time to full-time. We had some 32-hour employees that moved to 40-hour to employees. Um, and the way we laid out that staffing plan, we looked at those estimates for potential revenues and participation, and we balanced those with, with new positions. And so that budget that we presented you showed I a balance that. between I the two. What I was noticing was I didn't visualize so many little desks with people. Um, so it definitely. So the one, the one that's probably the biggest impact is having being able to staff two entrances. So we have a theater entrance or theater senior center community room ent re entrance and a recreation entrance that was accounted for in that um, okay. staffing plan. Oh, okay. um, so it, the increase on front desk staff um, was pretty significant. The increase on lifeguards was very significant. All of those spaces where we went from a single space yeah. to two spaces um, really up our staffing requirement. Facility upkeep. Uh, custodians as well. Custodians. Yes. Okay. I can't guarantee we have a perfect plan yeah, in place, but it's definitely something that we evaluated. Yeah. Traffic in and out of Memorial Park, where we have the parking on the exit side rather than the entrance side. Is there a reason behind, according to this picture, is there a reason that we put the parking on the exit rather than the entrance? The reason, the reason for that is to preserve the existing sculpture in place. If we were to put parking uh, on the north side of the road as you're coming in, where the, scu the veteran sculpture is, it would basically uh, have to cut into this plaza line, that line right there. It's page 12 of, of uh, whatever you have, 69. <coughs> this one that you were working with. Is oh, the image that I can't show you on the screen. screen. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, that's my blank the, screen. The, yeah. Yes, that's the, the area I was pointing to. I'm sorry? Yeah, we can't have, uh, there's parking up here, and if we draw that line, it goes right through the No, no, I'm talking here. about the parking here. This is exit parking. This road is in and out. There's only parking on the exit side. Can I just see? Yeah, it's, uh, um, I know. I get it. Sorry, I, this right is the here. one screen I don't have. So you come into the parkway. <clears throat> this is the problem. I'm coming into the parkway. I see an empty spot. I'm making a U-turn and pulling into that spot. Okay, I'm not going to go all the way around the rec center to get that spot. I see what you mean. You can I show you a couple? Of, <laughs> so let me show you a couple up on the screen. I'm sorry. It's going to be sex to say they're legal. <laughs> What, so well, I mean, it's, <laughs> if there is parking as you get farther down. Mm -hmm, just kidding. <coughs> so right there, there, are, there, there are two options to access this that parking. And it doesn't mean we can't look at adding some more in there as well. Other than, I, I say it doesn't mean we can't add. There are architectural limitations, as Daniel keeps telling me. I'm like, can't you just rearrange it and draw it this way? I can draw it. Even, sometimes tell me no. I wouldn't, I'm not necessarily saying add. <coughs> Take away. Oh, okay. So that people can't make that U-turn and cause that traffic jam hazard. Sure. sure. So the, the intent of that parking, though, is to be there for future development. Nice spots. Yeah. That really isn't. It's. It's not going to be convenient. Uh, for phase one, this parking probably won't get used that much at all because people are going to want. I always say the most important thing in exercise is to get as close to your point of exercise as parking as you can reasonably park. So everybody's going to try and get as close to the rec center as possible. As we talked about future development, if it's going to be according to the scale, then you really are limiting the parking. You have to push, you have to push the development back. The, um, Sort of the line. Yeah, no, I, we're, that's why that's why we're having the conversation. <laughs> so if somebody, and I'm, this one, I'm just asking opinion. If you were to drive in here and you saw a spot here, 
Do you think people would be willing to come up here and do that turnaround to come into that spot? You think they're just going to make a left turn? Well, no, you also have the, no, you uh, the ability to come to the south. Just saying. Once you get the feel for how this works, people will start coming in the south side, too. Yeah. I mean, the concern I'm hearing is just people, when they're driving, sometimes make the choice that's most convenient for them. Yeah, I know the people like Jordan. Um, can I just say one final comment? Um, when you're looking at the theater, um, and this is page 61, um, the, I'm being picky, but the, I guess, horizontal line, whatever uh -huh. you would call that, it's like <coughs> this right yes. here. I don't, I don't like what that looks. Okay. They're different, like, I don't know. I don't know why. I just don't like the way that looks. The, the vertical slats yeah, the vertical on slats. the right Thank side. Thank you. I was like, I don't know how to do that. I don't know. I just think it looks kind of that. Sure. Do you want to talk about how that's a, a theme that's inside the theater as well as we brought it outside? If you look back at your... I like the Yeah. On, on the inside of the theater, you can see part of, part of what we're articulating in the reflective acoustical sides of the theater is that slatting effect. We then chose to bring that out into the lobby over the box office and bar so that the theater wouldn't be just this orphan language inside the building. And then looked at employing that so that you get some sense of that arrival, a hint of that on the outside of the building as well. Okay. I'm glad you picked it up. More of a theme. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. I did not notice that. And, and for us, it also it, it provides some texture, it provides some shadowing that makes the building more interesting during the daytime on, on this face particularly. Any other strong feeling from that or other elements that you've seen? Is it possible on what Antonio's concern is that you could put, I know it adds money, whatever you do, so a raised median, like maybe not super high, but something small, so people couldn't possibly make that U-turn into those spaces. Can have the team look at that? I don't know what the cost of that would be, but I know it's extra, so. And are you thinking just in that first portion where there isn't parking on both sides, because or? Because people will do it down at the bottom, too, if they can. I think it has to be the whole way. Well, he's concerned about people right. going to So right. just the yellow line turning into like some type of a raised feature. See, it has a two way street, right? It is. It right. is a two way street, isn't it? Right. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it's cool. we'll, we'll, we'll look at all. Yeah. Yeah. We'll look at all. Just throw it out there. <laughs> no, I'd like to turn this place out. What about a chain link fence? We put a chain link fence out. There you go. No, we can't do that because. Street for events, so there's trade offs. Um, so we'll bring that back to you and fences. Okay, so then the skateboarders can go right down the middle. There you go. Probably a better way to do this, but I'm making everybody dizzy with scrolling. Um, so the last thing that we wanted to tell you is that we are still um, in the process of figuring out when we're going to, when and how we're going to engage the community still. Um, there are different uh, things that we're looking at, uh, like you have a list there on your last page, tot, lot, play structure, leisure pool, play feature, memorial park refurnishings, outdoor patio activities for the seniors, drive naming. Um, <laughs> had one other one that you fitness had equipment, fitness the, equipment the more specialized fitness equipment um, and and in talking to Amanda where our intent here is to engage these various groups in maybe different manners but uh, to try and engage definitely engage different groups and age groups and, and users so we're not just going to the parents so we're not just going to the seniors and we're, we're trying to get the breath of, of, of users across the board. question when this public process will be done this year on uh, our 50th anniversary year, that's correct. Okay. Um, and I think that it could be an great incorporation of our, this 50th <coughs> year and when they decide these naming rights or however they're going to look, that we can incorporate it overall as 
we decided this on such a big year, um, here's the next 50 years or something. I think it'd be helpful to have some recipe for the anniversary. Yeah. I haven't thought of that. That's a good suggestion. And we really haven't thought of any naming ideas at all. Yeah. So that's a brand new piece for and us. And it might be fun just, you know, we would kind of going through and making sure that we're still <laughs> moving forward and we last a little bit of time before that we can incorporate a lot of this naming this year. And I would say of these things, the naming can happen probably later than some of the others. Totally. Or however they want to decide what would be fun to do it within this year. Yeah. Thank you. <coughs> and final thought on out outreach, and I think you said this at the very beginning, but it was a long time ago. So um, did you talk about um, staff input into this process as well? And have they seen um, the most up-to-date, I guess, plans? Because I'd be really interested, because they're the ones who operationalize all of this. They're the ones who actually make it happen. So, like, I'm thinking, like, the person who puts up Christmas lights. What is he or she thinking about this? Or, you know, the person who does, you know, how, how are they um, getting their opinion heard to make sure that this is fully operational and going to work great? So they've been involved in many different ways throughout the process. One is those staff who are directly impacted by a specific area, the programming of that area, have been able to sit through the workshops and provide input directly to the team. Um, two is, and we've brought in everybody from our facilities maintenance staff um, to our coordinator and supervisory level staff. Um, I, since we got the SD package, we have also, I've been rolling it out to each individual work group, so all of our fitness instructors. All of, so far I've met with fitness, I've met with the front desk and custodial staff. Um, I have meetings scheduled with each of the other work groups over the next two weeks or so for them to provide feedback. Um, the first two groups we that were very um, positive. They had, they had questions about the space, but nothing specific that stood out as a red flag to them or a, an area of concern. Um, we also presented it to the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board this past Thursday. So it's definitely getting rolled out to each of those groups with the opportunity to provide some input. Part of the reason I'm doing, my staff is huge and varied. Um, and so trying to give them the opportunity to sit down in a group of eight or 10 or 12 people where they feel a little more comfortable providing that input, it's really hard if there's 75 people in the room to say you're concerned about where the storage is for the equipment that meets your needs. So my hope is that gives them the opportunity to do that. Also, two of your aquatic staff, <clears throat> a couple of other facilities too, to get their input on how those those particular uh, projects are functioning, so they can so we can incorporate some of those ideas as well. Brought preschool staff to those tours as well, aquatic staff, um, and then all of the supervisory staff. The line looks amazing. It is very exciting. Um, what are the potential delays? Um, at the moment, um, I, we don't have any known delays. Um, there may be some potential of uh, what we're looking at um, uh, building up against uh, CDOTs right away that uh, we're working through with Brooks team now. Um, but we we don't see any delays for the project. Uh, we just see sort of setbacks within the schedule, uh, but we don't see the bookends uh, at the moment. I think the bookends are, are, are going to stay pretty close. So we, we may shuffle stuff around in the middle, but um, that's for us to deal with and not, not for you. So And we'll continue to do those monthly updates. So um, certainly anytime we have something that starts to indicate we might be veering off that schedule, we'll make sure that we let you know. So we have those slated for the second regular council meeting of every month. So next Monday, you'll have an update on where we're at. That's a lot of work. So the ask of council this evening is for us, do we accept the schematic design and let them move forward into design development, keeping into consideration the comments that were made by council members tonight? I've heard some yes. considerations for the entry on the senior center, yep. for the exiting from the theater, for the U -turn potential U-turn on, on Memorial Parkway, <laughs> and for access to the um, jetted yeah. pool area that I need to come up with a way to Yeah, how good the chain link. And the swimming pool entertainment district. 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 Swimming
Well, we will be back next week with a brief update, and we will let the team get to work on starting the design development phase. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. It's very exciting for us. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank
Our next item tonight is the 2019 Residential Street Program. Kent, hand it over. Thank you. Um, I'm Kent Kesselman, the Director of Public Works. I promise this will not be as exciting as the <laughs> last um, presentation. So we're going to talk about the roads. Um, so we we handed out a map here with our proposed 2019 program. I'll try to go through the memo um, quickly here. So we we do um, a program each year. Um, this year's focus, we're, we're kind of getting to the point where we need to do some serious mill and overlays. So um, over the last couple of years, you've noticed that we've, we've, we've been able to do chip seals and slurry seals and mix those in. Um, some of these roads that we're doing this year um, Specifically, Grant is a um, road that we did part of last year, and then we're really trying to tie in um, some other aspects of our programs that connect North Glen and complete streets. So um, those the streets that that those affect are um, you know complete mill and overlays. We will still be doing crack sealing on roadways, and that'll be done internally as we move along. Um, the PCI index, of course, is our measurement. Um, in, in 2016, we um, started using the, the LiDAR technology. Uh, we're going to do that again in 2019. That, that um, contract has already been awarded, same company, and we'll start that in May. So um, we won't have the data, of course, for this year, but we want to, um, again, build um, our program, our street program, uh, years, years in advance, a five- a ten-year program with the data that we receive from that 2019 um, information to be able to see the degradation from 16 to 19 with that consistency. So we're looking forward to that. As far as the um, uh, actual streets that we've picked, again, we have about 105 lane miles of roadway. Um, the proposed mill and overlay streets for this year, we have Grant, as I mentioned, is uh, the, the completion of the, the one we did in, in uh, 18. Um, Larson, uh, from Muriel to 100. 105th, that's just a, a poor conditioned street. And then Phillips and 115th, those sections are again a part of the Connect North Glen, so they'll be, um, we'll be able to add bike lanes and, and crosswalks and, and charros in, in, a, in accordance with our Connect North Glen plan. So that's a good uh, um, project to, to move forward with that. We have two bid alternates. Again, um, when we get to the pricing, I'll explain a little bit. Um, we, we have um, bid alternates on here because we'd like to um, get good pricing. We may not have the money for the pricing, but if the, the, the bids come in favorable, then we already have the streets selected. So Truda and Tran, uh, Transit, Trancred, Tanker, Tankard, Tankard, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> um, have both, we've, we've received uh, several calls over the last year, year and a half on those streets, so we've identified those as, as need of um, a mill and overlay. And then as we go through, of course, we're doing Melody, and uh, that's a separate line item in the CIP, but to get a, a benefit of cost, we want to bid all, the, all of them at once um, to get a good price. Um, we're also going to do um, the, the residential concrete program, which we've done every, every single year. And over the last couple years, we've used the, the CDBG funds um, to do huge amounts of area of, of concrete. And so in 2015, we went out and stone by stone basically examined each piece of sidewalk and, and did a condition. And, and so over the last four years, we've really knocked a bunch of that out, especially with the, the block grant money. And so we, we need to reassess that. So um, we were struggling to find some areas for that. Um, so we, we would, we're moving the, the concrete program money into the residential street um, program so we can do more mill and overlay streets. But in a, of course, with those streets, these specific streets, um, concrete is a part of that program. So we replace the sidewalks in need along those streets. And we have other um, programs where um, uh, we have an on-call contract and we have some money in operations where if we get a, a one-off that, that is in need of uh, concrete, we can, we can still perform those and get those done um, under contract. Um, and as you know, the, the CDBG funds this year will be used for Claude, so that's not included in this. And those have to be, we can't bid that project or roadway um, improvements in this same um, 
uh, funding because it's a different funding source. It, it has to be the um, Davis Bacon. So the budget, um, we just kind of touched on that a little bit. We had 750 budgeted. We've spent $45,000 on the PCI, which left us 800 or 705. If we add in the 100,000 from the concrete, that'll give us 805. <clears throat> um, and Melody alone is a million, so we're not uh, taking anything from the Melody. We're just leaving that. And then um, we can get all of our proposed um, residential streets, the 115th, Grant, Larson, and Phillips. We're hoping to get all done and then, um, you know, again, see if we get favorable bids back for the, for the other two. And the prices that we estimate, these were last year's prices, so again, we're in the height of the economy, so we're using, um, you know, big, big prices and expenses that, that may not be the same, and we're doing a lot more asphalt work this year, so hopefully we'll get a good um, price on mobilization and, and uh, the tonnage of asphalt will go down. Then included in the packet is the same thing from, from uh, the last time or the last years is just the, the kind of the, the picture of the truck that, that comes and, and drives the street. It only takes a couple days for them to drive the entire city. And then um, just some um, examples of what a, a rated street is. So, you know, we have zero to 20, very poor, 20 to 30, poor, um, 30 to 40, marginal, 40 to 55, fair, 55 to 70, good, 70 to 85, very good, 85 to 100, excellent. Um, our totality, based on the 2016 assessment, all of our streets average out to be about a 57. And based on the resolution, we want to be at a 70. So um, we got so, a little bit of work to do, but we're, we're, we're making good progress. Yes? Is there public accessible like report that has all the streets and all their ratings? The PCI report. Okay. Is that, but how would someone look that up? We can, we can send it to you if you'd like. Um, we'll probably have to do some manipulation on it just so, because there's, there's lots and lots of numbers on there. So if you just want to see like the street and the PCI, um, we can do that. Um, note that the like the PCI. So just for example, and then I'll get to Ms. Wolford's question. So like Melody is a long section street. So there isn't just one. It, it shows a 54 here. It's a rating. That's kind of our average. But each like block to block is a segment that gets rated its own PCI <coughs> segment. So there's thousands of numbers to look at. If somebody wanted to. I mean, I get a ton. I mean, sure. My residents are quieter than most, but when they do uh, reach out, they're asking about when is my road next. Right. And so if they don't understand this, because this made sense to me when you explained it, but it'd be nice to be able to say, and then your road is a blank. Right. And that is really the effort that we're going to uh, be working hard in 2019 after we get this information is, again, seeing what how the roads are deteriorating um, based on that consistency rating. Um, and we'll be able to tell over three years, hey, this, this looked like we'd be able to do a chip seal on it, but it really went downhill in only three years. So now we need to do a full mill and overlay or um, you know, a, a just a, a, you know, a, a edge mill or something like that. So what we wanna do um, in public works is build a five and a 10 year and maybe even out to a 15 year just roadway CIP program. I mean, it's almost a subset of the CIP, um, but that's gonna take a little bit of time because it hasn't been done. But we really need the information um, from the team. 16 engineers and some operational staff were, were just going out by hand and doing it based on the ASTM standard. You know, they're saying, oh, well, they may see an alligator crack differently than somebody else sees an alligator crack or longitudinal cracking or whatever that may be. So just with this, the, the LIDAR system, it's, it's one al um, algorithm and just spits out. So even if one treatment may be higher or lower on um, the aspect of degradation, it'd be relative. So it, um, it, it doesn't really push one thing up or down and we'll be able to do a real good comparison on that. 
but that's our intention is to do that. So um, I, I can make the PCI data available. It may not mean a whole lot at this point, but, but we can certainly make it available if you have questions. Just to add to that, um, Kent has been sharing with me an idea in terms of trying to map out CIP projects um, interactively um, through our website. So that would be a good component if we can add at some point in terms of residents being able to go onto the website, click on a map, and pull up information on their street. So I think that would be the most ideal way to communicate the information. We're not there yet, but um, we're working towards that just with um, zoning in on locations of CIP projects. And actually, I saw a presentation from a different city who's kind of done Castle Rock. A lot, so several cities, yeah, they, they have, it's an interactive GIS map where you can pull up different data and, um, and get project timelines, project budgets, um, and, and that sort of thing. You can put closure information on it. And um, one question that I did have is, I guess, just to kind of wrap my head around this, so are these streets that you outlined here, are these the worst breaking PCI? Right, and that, you know, when you when you live that da data, you know, then somebody says, well, you're doing East 115th, which is only a 57, and mine's a 32. How come you're not doing my street? Well, again, we want to, um, you know, as we talked about um, in some of our other study sessions, is what's the, the benefit of the community? So does this address, again, with Connect North Glen, is it going to um, address the complete streets policy? Is it near a school? Does it, is it an area that we've done before, or have we focused in one area and not another? Is one ward getting more treatments than another? So all those factor in. So it, we, we don't just look at the number. We take in um, other considerations as well, you know, the, the, the damage of the concrete. Have we received calls over the time, um, you know, the last year, two years on that street? So, um, yeah, many factors go into in the selection of streets. and. and we have yeah. more streets to do than we have funding available. Because so. I think that is, that's the hard part to have a communication about, right. is, especially if you're knocking on doors in some of these areas and you're like, your street is absolutely terrible, I feel so sorry for you, Right. yet you're not on our map. And I'm not really sure how to have that conversation and like, sorry you're not by school, sorry you didn't call too many times, like, yeah. I mean, how can we communicate that better <laughs> and communicate to people like, this time you're not going to get a new street, but maybe in the future. I mean, like, it's, I, I understand we only have so much money, mm -hmm. but if we're not fixing our worst roads first, it's it's really hard. Some of them are in really tough shape. So, and I think we can it's hard for you. We can, um, it's helpful to let us know when you're having those conversations, and we can provide you with talking points and um, that really try to drill down the program and, and make it easier to communicate with residents because as Kent said, it's not just simply the PCI scoring, there's other factors involved. And that's really true for a lot of the CIP related projects that we have. Um, so we can certainly work on getting you some more information about that and we can send it to all of council. And, and it's not uncommon for us to get requests about a specific street. And um, so, you know, some of it is you can look at a roadway and have a perception about what that roadway looks like and then with the PCI data you know that combined um, often helps with that conversation so having the updated PCI data that we're going to get through the study this year will help moving forward I have two questions outlines their processes as well as an overview of what the PCI is because I love the direction that we're going in terms of having the interactive maps. I think it's I think it's totally appropriate and I think it's exactly what we should be doing. But I wonder about the interim and the fact that a lot of us do get a, many questions around when is my street going to be paved? Why I perceive mine to be worse than my neighbors. And so I like if there's just something mm -hmm. online that we can People yeah, we'll work with having the same information. I think that would be really helpful. We can do that. <coughs> Great. And then my second question um, is, is very similar to Julie's around um, the, 
the reality that we have some streets that are in worse condition than others. Um, Huron Street is one that's that's pointed out here as having one of the lowest ratings. Um, the southernmost portion of that street, which is an entrance to our city, has a PCI of 17. And I know that oftentimes we put aside some of those projects that have the potential to be much larger, but are in very poor condition. And so I'm just curious, how and when are we going to have the conversation <coughs> about when we are fixing Huron? Are we going to just be taking it in chunks because we don't have the money to completely reconstruct the road? Um, what What is our approach? Because I I mean, that, that southern part from 98 to Melody Drive, I mean, it really is bad. Well, the other thing we're doing in Public Works now is, is we're, we're taking a look at the, the totality of all the CIP um, things. So we've been meeting in large groups um, all the way down from supervisors and their, you know, their lead uh, positions and, and really meeting and, and talking about what do they see, um, you know, as far as uh, things that are out there, um, you know, studies on, on master um, on signals, a master study for our lights, um, you know, roadways, larger roadways, and putting that um, all together in, and trying to get everything that could be CIP related that we see and get that in one list and then and what does that um, look like and I, I'm not sure if Heather's mentioned it before but we're, we're trying to work on that criteria that is um, you know what is a what is a CIP criteria and how is a one project selected over another so we continue to effort with uh, the development review committee team and the leadership team um, developing those criteria and I think think we're getting closer and we're um, and I, I'm not sure when Heather is going to present that but I I think it could be at your one of your summits um, but um, Heather has said this many times and, and I really try to take it to heart it's a marathon not a sprint and I I want to sprint and I know sometimes you guys want to sprint too um, but we're, we are we are really trying to change things and, and take a holistic look at, at all of our programs and and all of the projects that we have in public works and, and and really get them in a in a singular list and a rating system and and be able to present those to you so you can take a look and, and find out what the totality is of those dollars and 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 it, it may be overwhelming and, and what do we do as a city so the hard conversations are I think coming. Again, we're trying to put that information together. So we'll be bringing that criteria that Kent talked about and that I've mentioned um, to council previously. Um, once we get it fully vetted with staff, um, we're going to take the, the next step of um, scoring some of the projects against the criteria that we have developed to date and see how um, the scoring shakes out and if it makes sense before we bring it to you all to review and provide feedback on. So my vision is that each year we use a CIP criteria in terms of development of staff recommendations for the CIP budget. So when you're looking at the CIP budget, all of that vetting and scoring has already taken place. So I'm bringing the CIP budget to you and saying these are our top priorities and here's why. Um, so an additional piece that Kent talked about earlier is, is really building that five to 10 to 15 year CIP. There's more need throughout the city than available funding. So part of that exercise is, okay, what does the need look like? What's that projected dollar figure? And then how do we fill that gap? Um, is it leveraging funding through um, other partnerships? And you know, is there potential to work with a neighboring, neighboring jurisdiction if there's um, an adjacent roadway? <laughs> impact um, and, and that sort of thing. So we, we have yet to have that discussion, but that's how I envision that coming forward. To, to piggyback on uh, what Jenny was saying, pictures worth a thousand words. Put this on the website, people understand what you're trying to do. <clears throat> Not that you get your way, but this is what we're doing and this is how we're evaluating our streets. I mean, then okay. Yeah, we agree. I mean, I, I, we really want to promote public works and the things that we're doing. We're doing great things. We have great staff. And so, um, you know, even one of the things that we haven't done in the past is celebrate Public Works Week, and that's coming up here in, in May. So we want to really put an emphasis and focus, and here's one of our public works employees right now, um, you know, here 
because the air conditioning is, yeah. is not working right now. But, but that's, that's a small thing, but that's the type of service that we want to provide in public works. You know, we have an issue, we have a problem, we want to bring it forward and we want to take care of it right away. Again, that's the sprinting part, um, you know, but then there's the marathon part that we need to, you know, sit back and, and do some work on. So you're seeking consensus to approve your approach to the 2019 Residential Street Program. And if bids come in favorable and we're able to do Tancred and Trudad, then um, yep. we will provide you with an update at a future meeting. We got a call again today from somebody on Truda. That's the fourth person. I don't know why. Do they contact you, Joyce, on What's Truda? about Truda? Yeah. That they really want that one mill and overlay. So it was just kind of timely that I got another call. Today. So I hope that that one goes through, too. Thank you. Okay. All right. Our next item this evening is short-term rental properties draft ordinance. And Corey, you're up. Hopefully, I'm just ornamental. <laughs> no, you said you were. <laughs> just kidding. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, I'll do a quick walkthrough here, and then we'll open it up to questions. Um, let me just start out by saying that uh, this, this process was triggered as a result of the adoption of the UDO. And so with that, I just want to identify a few key highlights here that's already outlined in the UDO. Um, one is, is that uh, ADUs, which is the new um, th uh, new uh, zoning tool that we've added, would not be eligible. Neither are home, mobile homes, RVs, or travel trailers. So in this case, we don't have any mobile homes, but we also do have a lot of people who park RVs and whatnot in their, on their properties. Those are not eligible. Um, and then also cannot exceed 30 days. Um, and, and keep in mind that this is cross-referenced throughout various aspects of the new UDO, so I just included all those references so that you knew that this is in fact under the definition and under the use terms, that, this is, that these are the provisions that are covered. So with that, we reflected that um, within the proposed ordinance, or draft ordinance that you have before you. And so quickly, I'll just walk through some of this stuff, but essentially, uh, you know, license will be required. Uh, they'll need to renew it on an annual basis. Um, we're going to basically, through this policy uh, process, is send out notices in November because this will end at the calendar year so that they have to renew in the month of December so that it'll be easier for us to track that. Also, I'll mention that by calendar year, if you apply in July, it's only good till the end of the year. So another thing administratively that we will also do because when you start staggering it out, it becomes almost impossible to track. So. Um, we also do that with contractor licensing and various other licensings that, that at least through my department, that's how we took advantage of. Um, health and safety standards. So a lot of this stuff, I'm not gonna walk through all of it, but one thing I am gonna mention on, on this next set of bullets is that this will all be reflected as part of the application, which is not part of the discussion tonight, uh, but will be brought forward at second reading through vis-a-vis -a, -vis a resolution. Um, however, having said that, one of the ways that we intend to administer this is that there will be a safety inspection by the building department that will go out and make sure that there's proper signage exiting smoke detectors, carbon monoxide detectors, uh, that, that the bedrooms are appropriate uh, and whatnot. So um, one other thing that I also want to mention in this is that we also point out that there's no retail or commercial activity shall be permitted. The idea here is, is that we don't want to have a home occupation. I'm also in a short-term rental property because it's very hard to track who's who in traffic and therefore difficult to enforce against. Um, also, one other key point here that's not part of an inspection is uh, no more than one leasee per day per property. So in other words, if you have a three bedroom house and you have two free bedrooms, you want to rent them out to two separate people that are not of the same party, that would not be allowed. Um, if you have a family of four, renting the same two bedrooms and they're one party, that would be completely legal. Okay, so um, also we've also added some, some pr uh, policy language here regarding the advertising so that if you are posting this on a website, i.e. Airbnb or others, you would also need to reference within that, uh, that web posting the reference number for the licensing. Um, and obviously no one can, can advertise without having a license. Uh, and then I'm gonna defer to Corey here, but 
uh, on the next couple of, of talking points, but essentially what I want to try to talk about at a planning high level is that we've created as much flexibility with the applicability of our, of our existing regulations to be able to act and enforce against anybody who attempts to game or manipulate uh, the policy. The only thing I'll add is the goal of the ordinance is to assure that anyone that's using their property as a short-term rental is not impacting the neighborhood. So things like having one lease per house per day means you limit the number of vehicles typically. Um, so it's the things that would impact neighbors that, are in, that these are intended to address. The one thing we had to look into is because short-term rentals are in, in sort of historical terms new is whether there is some sort of property right that requires a hearing process. And so the last portion of the code is to address that. Um, it is a standard that the city clerk will have, uh, will be the first line of defense. It will only get to you if someone appeals the city clerk's determination and the standard is extremely deferential to the city clerk. So in other words, unless she abuses her discretion, unless there is no competent evidence to support her decision, um, her decision under the short-term rental will stand. So frankly, the goal is it won't get to you. Um, but there may be times where someone believes they've been treated unfairly, and so there is an appellate process to you. But uh, I was thinking about the how you monitor this. So, like, if I just wanted to put my property on the website and have someone come out, how are you going to know? Like, is someone going to monitor those websites to see if North Glen addresses come up and then to see if those are licensed properties? Or is it just something that we're hoping people will do the right thing and follow the right process? So, I can tell you that. The latter is, I think, where we would start because we already have people reaching out now asking when these provisions are going into effect. Um, I would also mention that one of the things that, as I understand through Jason, is that with, with websites like Airbnb, they're trying to, to establish a collective remittance um, for, for people that use their website for the sales tax. And in doing so, they would then identify those properties. And so therefore, we can cross-reference against because under, under Jason's process, you got to have a business license um, to, do, to, to conduct business in North Plain. And so we would be able to sort of cross-filter through that process. My understanding is that's the direction we're heading. I don't know that we're quite there yet. But this is not unlike um, IBM and Dell and Microsoft when they sell licenses to a company within a city. They never transact, but we end up getting the sales or use tax to that because it gets remitted through those companies because we, we do audits of those. So that's how we anticipate that moving forward. Clearly, if we have somebody that is a history uh, of, um, of you know, acting, we, can, we will track them down. And, and my experience in other communities is this, this becomes a tool when there's an impact on the neighborhood. So um, if suddenly there are several cars out in front where there weren't before, this is one of the things the city will look at because, again, if the goal is to address impacts on the neighborhood and you suddenly see that there's different cars at all times, this is one of the possibilities. Thank you. Um, along the same lines is I've worked in Denver um, on their short-term rental um, process and everything else. And I know that I'm sure you review Denver's as well, and it's it's much stricter than this one is currently. And I think a lot of things that happened in Denver with these bad actors, they were able to do the crackdown when they made some stipulations. One being primary residence, and another one being insurance requirements. And what you find is if something happens at this property, it not only protects the owner of the property, but also the individual which is staying in that property at that time. Um, so I don't know how we have that conversation of my desire to see stricter limits when it comes to this ordinance to make sure that we can eliminate the bad actors and that people aren't just buying units in the city of Northland to have a short-term rental. That's all. Um, and that takes and that speaks to housing overall. So to translate what you said, you'd like to see a requirement that this be a primary residence and that there's additional insurance coverage for this type of use. 
Yes, um, I know in the Pennsylvania County of Denver, as along with Boulder and Colorado Springs, we had a hard time identifying what exactly is a primary residence and what does that look like. Um, and there, was, there were certain things that we had come up with, and I don't mind providing the spreadsheets that I had done for the research across, um, across the region. But I would like to see stricter requirements when it comes to primary residence and insurance stipulations. Um, lastly is when it comes to the price of this licensure. Have we thought of the cost? We have not. Okay. Um, we're, that's one of the things that we would be working on. Um, the, the goal would be is that we would, the license would cover the administrative and inspection costs. Okay. So um, depending upon, we just haven't gotten, before we go to that next level, we want to get consensus first, and then we can come back with that. Yeah. And, and let, me, let me address Councilmember Sauer's comments, because I think that's something that's worthy of discussion. It's a, that is a different or additional legislative purpose for Denver's ordinance above and beyond this. This was structured to address impacts on the neighborhood. Um, if you want the additional um, provisions related to things like primary residence and insurance, that's frankly more geared towards protecting the consumer. Um, and it's, it's just a different and additional methodology, and it really depends on what problem you're trying to solve. And so we can certainly add those additional layers, but I think it's worthy of discussion what the purpose of the ordinance is. No, and I'd love that, and I'm providing the research for council. It's just making sure that we're hitting this at the start as opposed to doing it later in the game. And we ran into that in Denver. We're trying to come back and go through the process again when it would have been helpful to have done it from the beginning. Can I ask a clarifying question? Um, so this is saying ADUs cannot be used as short-term rentals. Can they be used as long-term? Um, I'd have to go back and double check. I believe I believe that they can. Well, to confirm that. So in that case, I'm just kind of confused about why there's a difference between the two. I mean, if you, if I'm going to rent out my ADU, I'm going to have a car there or whatever who's going to be living there for like a year or two, whatever, versus somebody a new car every single month. I guess I'm just kind of confused about why. Are we separating out short-term and long-term rentals? And where did that conversation start? It started here when we were going through the ADU process and that council had expressed a concern about making ADUs available for short-term rental for purposes of exploiting the, the policy and creating an adverse impact to the community, to the surrounding neighbors. That was, that was why this is partially structured the way it is, is because of that <coughs> feedback. is trying to find these bad actors and these individuals who are being able to search Airbnb and all of the other platforms, which there are multiple, and it, you know, probably seven or eight or nine. Um, and in San Francisco, they have a full-time individual who sits and does specifically short-term rentals and nothing else. And I know that's an extreme case because we're not the size of San Francisco and so on and so forth, but um, by adding increased stipulations and being able to identify that this is not your primary residence, you don't have these requirements, we're able to find those bad actors uh, faster than we would if we just had an open or a much, um, yeah, much open ordinance that allows people to, I guess, interpret it very differently. Maybe I'm misunderstanding, but what I think I hear Corey saying is that, and this is probably not exactly what you're saying. Um, I, I'm not going to put these words in your mouth. This is what I interpret. Heard. This is my interpretation. Is that if I wanted to use my home for Airbnb purposes or something like that, whatever website, as long as the people that are renting my home in a short term basis don't bug anybody in the neighborhood, this isn't going to become an issue. But this is the protection for if they misbehave while they're there. That's what this is good for. And, and the difference, that's the, that's the underlying yeah. purpose. And, and I think the difference in what um, some of the more robust short-term rental ordinances that have the provisions that Councilmember Sowers is talking about, mm -hmm. that's also protecting, um, th there's a policy determination that it is necessary to have the owner on site. That's a different methodology. Um, because this simply says, if the house is walking and talking like a residence, based on impacts to the neighbors, then that's acceptable. 
Denver says, no, we want this to be an accessory use. We want it to be a room or two on top of the primary residence. And, by the way, we want to protect you, consumer, with certain insurance provisions. This is not a consumer protection type ordinance in this draft. This is more of a neighborhood protection. And the, the provisions Councilmember Sowers is talking about, we can certainly add. Um, they weren't in the original draft because at least we understood part of the purpose of this was more geared towards what I'll call the, the compatibility in the neighborhood provision. Can I ask an additional clarifying question? Um, so the way that Jordan is talking about the ordinance is that you, uh, me as an owner, I have to be on site and I can only use the property that I own as a primary residence if I want to offer a short-term rental opportunity. Correct. Okay. And this right now as written says that um, Corey who lives in Louisiana who has a home in North Glen could use his North Glen home which is not his primary residence that he only gets out to when he's you know not busy um, for Airbnb. That so is Corey precisely correct. Come out and be a part of the community or physically see the impacts potentially of that Airbnb. Uh, although, although I think the um, the nature of a short-term rental is that someone is going to be checking on it because things like cleaning, okay. things like where you leave the key, <laughs> um, things like codes. Um, so for those that have used Airbnb, um, I would suggest it is more difficult to be an absentee owner. But what Denver did and what others have done, making it a primary residence, is much more limiting. Um, but if that's what if that's what the council wants, we can certainly that's an easy addition. And, and I I can tell you more pers personal anecdotal uses of Airbnb is um, I when I've gone out to Grand Junction, I meet the owners and they're they're staying at their family's they're staying at a family or friend's house and and basically you know they come right back. So I mean I think there's a bandwidth in which the owner uh, situation I think. From a from an operational logistical standpoint, what effectively um, the policy direction that's being suggested is you you could not rent out the entire residence. You could only rent out rooms um, un, uh, because the owner would have to be on the premise. Is there a way to word it so that you can only rent out your full time residence as opposed to just? <laughs> Yeah, in fact, I think that's what both Councilmember Sowers and Brooke are saying. Um, in Brooke's scenario, I suspect the, per the family in Grand Junction, that is their primary residence. Right. But again, it's, it's Council's, um, it, it will be more limiting. And if that's Council's desire, that is certainly acceptable. My other question is around enforcement. Um, are we only enforcing when there is a nuisance call? Or, or in your scenario when we're receiving the tax revenue and we're matching it back? Is that, I'm, I'm just trying to get my head around Both. Where we've got this policy, but how do we enforce it? I, I, I would suggest that we're not going to be out looking for Airbnbs that are violating, but whether it's through sales tax, whether it's through nuisance, whether it's through any other means, if we learn about it, we're going to reach out. Could, if you say you rented out the home, we made that stipulation that I would go stay at my grandmother's home and rent out my home for a night or three nights um, would be just fine. It, to me, it comes to investment in the community that if that is my primary residence, that it, the upkeep is going to be there, that I know that my community, because I have to return there and that is my, my primary residence and I know that, the, that it's going to be a controlled environment. My also fear is that if we don't, and I live in Louisiana and I buy seven homes in North Glen, that I can Airbnb them all out. Um, and we can have people in and out whenever with very limited um, information or upkeep in these homes and in our community. A lot of rental units in a different way. So I have one more comment and then I'm good. Um, so we had a board meeting this weekend on Saturday and I spent some time speaking um, with a neighbor who um, 
we spent some time talking about accessory dwelling units and how he very much did not want these to be used as short-term rentals. And I'm really glad that this policy addresses that. But one of his primary concerns, I think, extends to um, you know, renting out a home um, in a neighborhood around he doesn't know the people who are coming in and out of the out of the community where he and his wife have chose to make an investment and um, you know he, he shared his frustration that um, you know the cost of living has increased in the metro area and that many people are having to live in homes now whereas these are traditionally single family homes and so with the increase in vehicles he had he has very close <coughs> neighbors who work with him, right? And he's had many conversations about parking and where they park in proximity to his home. And he shared that he was concerned that if we were to allow short-term rentals to come into the neighborhoods, that people could be parking in front of his home and he may not be able to have the cordial conversations that he has right now with his neighbor. And so I, you know, I, I I think about his concerns and I also think about the concerns that I've heard from folks around, you know, feeling like um, rental properties with owners that live out of state or out of the community don't take care of the property as, as well as they could. And I think that's a whole other discussion. But on that point, I feel really strongly that when it comes to short term rentals that it needs to be somebody's primary <coughs> residence. Um, I don't. I don't necessarily believe that they have to sleep on site um, while they're um, renting out their home, but I do think it should be a primary residence. Anyone else, or is there consensus that everybody would like to have the primary residence added into our ordinance? Well, I know personally people in my block who would be affected by this. So um, this individual owns a couple of houses. Um, on our block in a neighboring one, and they use them as short-term rentals, and it's not their primary residence. They've been great people. They've I've never had any issues. No one's ever had any issues with them. That would entirely, you know, affect this individual. So, not only are you trying to get bad actors, but you're also going to be taking out people who have done this responsibly in our community for decades. So we also need to remember that yes, we need to address bad actors, but we're also going to be affecting people who currently do this right now and have had no issues. So I think it's a really big step to make I guess I would throw out the question is that when you describe bad, bad actors, what is it that's bad about them? Yeah, I think it's more about if I live out of state, I buy six units in, in North Glen, I have a bachelor party at one, they trash something at the house, it interfered with our neighbors, and I'm in Louisiana, so it's very difficult for me to get home and assess the situation, or the constant in and out, and I don't really know what's going on in the community. I think there are a multitude of different what a bad actor is or what it's been done, and I think that if you get online or speak to other municipalities, you can have horror stories of Airbnbs and what that's done to the community overall. And, and I guess to the reason why I'm asking the question is is because one of the one of the considerations here is is. What, on, what within the current policy doesn't address the bad actor um, that would otherwise not require a primary residence requirement? Because what you just described, if, if there's, a, if there's a, a, a large scale party that's out of control and there's a complaint, that's a nuisance and we can enforce and revoke the license based off of that. Yeah. Um, I think you know, the bigger question that I'm hearing brought out on the table is, is whether or not a, primary, a non primary owner is not a good caretaker of the property or not. Um, which I would argue you could have whether it's a short-term rental or not. Um, and in some cases, your, your, your multiple property owners are maybe better caretakers than, say, others on the same block who are longtime residents. So, you know, there's a question of whether or not um, that's, that's equitable or not, I guess. And, you know, um, in hearing the conversation, I guess the thing that I would also throw out there is to, to take into account is, you're talking about not getting caught on the backside and getting in front of it. The other thought that I have is, is that we don't know that we have any bad actors because quite frankly, in, in the seven years I've been here, I don't think we've had one complaint on short-term rental. Um, and we know they exist because I go and check in my you know, detective way, um, which, is, 
by no means, you know, scientifically accurate, but, you know, overall, we probably have around 20 to 30, you know, properties that are listed from time to time, depending on time of year, um, that are on those like VBRO and, and Airbnb, and we don't have complaints on them. So I just throw that out there as, as, as part of the, the dialogue. <coughs> Because I'm hearing, I'm hearing that there's two sides to this coin. I'm trying to help yeah. foster the conversation. I think as long as it's enforceable, that if somebody's doing something wrong on our end, I think we're covered. And all of the other problems, or those are the problems that somebody takes on when they decide to rent out their home. You, you need to deal with it. It's not the city's problem. Um, they, in the end, will have to deal with whatever damage or whatever happens to their house. That's not our concern. But if they're disturbing the neighborhood and we can enforce, I feel okay with it as is and not making it a primary residence. So, that's my opinion. I'm not interested in seeing it as a primary residence. I think all those same issues are the issues that probably each one of us has on our block with a rental property. So, I mean, I got the guy that has parties constantly at his house. and. His homeowner lives in Pueblo, never comes and checks on the property. So, I mean, I think you're going to have that issue no matter where it is. Um, I also think I'm not necessarily on the 30-day. Um, where does this fall in line with someone who is, let's say, their job has sent them away for 90 days and they want someone? Where does that factor in? This is actually the same analysis as when you have a hotel and that triggers the lodging tax. So 30 days is actually the cutoff between something that is subject to lodging tax um, and something that's not. So that's where that was taken from. So you can have a long-term, I mean, Airbnb has long-term ads, would not be subject to this if it's over 30 days. So how about we get consensus and take a vote here whether who would like the primary residence as a requirement put into the ordinance? Is that it? Okay. What I would point out is if there's a problem, if we see a significant problem with, with absentee landowners that, because we will have now a framework and we'll have licenses and we'll know who's in town and who's, you know, which ones are primary residences and which aren't, frankly, from the license form. We can, we can create it so we know where they live. And so if we have that issue, we can react to it fairly easily. So is this something that after it's been in place for a year that we can bring back to a study session, even if it's for 15 minutes and say, look, this is working, we're not having a whole lot of issues, right? Like, can we just, put it on the calendar to circle back because yes. what Julie said really hit home for me in terms of like there are a lot of folks who are already making their income this way and probably shouldn't be crushing it. Um, but I, I just want to know that people's issues are being addressed. I, I think that to that end, um, if we have a problem before year, we will definitely be back before you yeah. uh, to address it. <laughs> Uh, but I think, by and large, you know, with the stuff that we do with the work plan, I think we can easily incorporate, you know, where where this type of activity is because we provide that kind of stuff already in, in other fashion. So. So is there consensus to move the draft ordinance as is forward to a city council regular meeting? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Lastly, this evening is campaign finance regulations. Four years stand put. Yes. Joanna's joining us. <laughs> Good night, y'all. Bid you all do. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you. information to help facilitate a discussion on whether City Council would like to consider some changes to our campaign finance regulations. Um, back at the, or the, excuse me, February 11, 2019, City Council meeting, Councilmember Wolford 
had stated five suggested items that she would like to consider and it was the consensus of council to move forward with scheduling a, a discussion on those items. Um, and you'll see the five items noted on the first page of the memo there. I do want to just note that the City of North Bend currently utilizes the campaign finance regulations that are found in Article 45 of Title I of the um, Colorado Revised Statutes. You might hear us talk about the FCPA. And when we do, we're referring to the Fair Campaign Practices Act. Um, with that, since the city is currently following the state regulations, if city council chooses to adopt local regulations, we will want to be either all in or all out. So meaning all in would be um, following, continuing to follow the state regulations, not having any uh, differentiating local regulations or being all out, which means we're going to adopt our own local regulations. The state is not going to enforce any of their provisions and the city would be responsible for the enforcement of whatever local provisions we adopt. And then with that, to me, this discussion is kind of a two-part discussion. We have the five suggested items that we're providing information about. If council decides to move forward, forward with any of those five suggested items, we'll want to consider some additional provisions that should definitely be in a local ordinance to make sure that we're covering all of the necessary um, requirements for campaign finance. So staff has provided information on each of the five topics. That information includes the proposed regulation, the city's current regulation, which is the state law, and then any new actions that would be required to implement the change. Um, council will need to decide what is appropriate for our community while being sensitive to um, the Constitution or First Amendment rights, um, which is where Corey comes in. And so I'm happy to answer questions as we go through or if you would like staff to take the lead on, on speaking to the information that we've provided on each item. Happy to move forward either way. Jump right in. You guys jump right Alrighty. in. So item number one, you'll see on page two, uh, that's the local donation limits. The proposed regulation was to create local donation limits for mayor and city council members, and the limit for mayoral candidates would be higher since that position is elected at large. So currently, there are no contribution limits for city council candidates in the city of North Glen. So the new action that we would, or the council would need to consider would be to set a dollar amount limit that donors, whether that donor is an individual or a committee, could contribute to candidate committees. So we've provided some uh, policy reasons for considering such a change. And these are, uh, they're not specific to the city of North Glen, they're not specific to Colorado, these are nationwide. Um, so, uh, definitely not suggesting that any one of these is a problem in the city of North Glen. These are just uh, policy reasons that various communities consider. So preventing corruption and the appearance of corruption, equalizing the ability of citizens to affect elections by muting the voices of wealthy contributors, and encouraging broader participation and opening the process to more candidates by curbing the cost of campaigns. Um, Items to consider if city council chooses to impose contribution limits. Those would be whether the contribution limits will significantly restrict the amount of funding available for challengers to run competitive campaigns. Um, said a different way, it's whether the limits will allow a challenger to overcome the name recognition advantage that's enjoyed by an incumbent. I can tell you when I've looked, I went back and looked at data from the last three elections. Uh, basic basic data regarding whether a candidate spent zero dollars, um, whether they were self-funded, or whether they had a candidate committee and they accepted contributions and made expenditures. Um, incumbents, I would say, definitely have an advantage because you can see that it's not the candidates who are raising the most money or who are spending the most money that are successful. If there's an incumbent in that race, you, the data shows that that person enjoys an advantage. Um, so there's no, I was looking you know, to see maybe what is the cost of, of being a candidate in the city of North Glen. That's kind of hard to, to nail down actually. Um, so I believe it's something that the city council, it, you know, I'm coming from, at this from one perspective. We're on one side of, of this issue. I think council has two great perspectives. 
you can speak to what you believe the city should look like for your constituents, and also you all were candidates. So you know how that campaign um, process happens and, and, and what the limits might be that might make sense for that if you decide that we should have contribution limits. There's a, a while well, I should finish those um, items to consider, the second one is imposing different contribution limits for individual donors and other donors, such as political committees. And the third one is including an automatic adjustment for inflation. You can see in the table um, at the bottom of that page that we've included some contribution limits from other municipalities that are imposing contribution limits at the local level. You'll notice Longmont has kind of a, a different number. It's $610 for mayor candidates. $240 for city council candidates, and that actually is because they have included that adjustment for inflation. Um, so that's why their, their number looks a little different. Some of the lower uh, numbers, Boulder for instance, $100, that's because they also allow public financing for campaigns. So that's, that's a whole different um, discussion, I believe. Uh, so that kind of gives a snapshot of, of some limits that other communities are imposing at this time. Denver is changing. Denver is changing, yeah. So you'll see their current limits right now, $3,000 <laughs> for mayor, $1,000 for uh, district candidates, and that's going to change January 1st of 2020 to be quite a bit lower. So um, one other note about contribution limits. Uh, like I said before, there are no campaign contribution limits for elections in the city of North Glen currently, and no contribution limits will affect a candidate's right to spend an unlimited amount of their personal funds on their campaign. Moving to the, to the top of the third page, we have included some draft ordinance language. Um, the amounts that are included there are only examples but it's just a snapshot of how this could be incorporated into a, a draft ordinance if council decides to move forward with that. How about we have discussion on each one of these items one by one? Is that good with you? Yes. Okay, so is there discussion? And, 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 and oh, Madam Mayor, the only thing I would mention is remember what Joanna said, it's all in. So at yeah. some point, council's gonna have to decide if they want the broader campaign finance regulations. Um, and maybe doing this piece by piece will kind of reflect on whether that's a, a good idea. But ultimately, um, if you say you want one and not the other, well, we're going to have to come back to that other later if you decide to do the regulations. Okay, thank you. All right, item one is open for discussion. What was the largest limit anyone has received as a candidate, either for mayor or council? Meaning largest amount, a single. Yeah. Lar okay, say that again. Meaning, like, what is the largest anyone has ever received in history uh, for a candidate of council or mayor? So, the largest contribution accepted? Yeah. I can find that. <laughs> I have totals. <laughs> I can find that, though. <laughs> <laughs> okay, update you after a little discussion. Would anyone else like to chime in while Joanna's checking that out? I mean, I'll, I'll chime in. Um, I think it's important for us to establish um, contribution limits, I think, exactly for the best practice reasons that are outlined in this memo. Um, and I think looking at this list of municipalities that um, has established limits, it's it's time for us to follow suit and do the same thing. I think it's also a great way to um, ensure that we're putting wealthy contributors and regular people on an equal level playing field. Are there any other cities that don't have contribution limits? Are we the only one? We're definitely not the only one. That is one thing I did not include. Um, kind of included the, the folks that have local regulations. What I didn't include is a list of the cities who are following the state, like North okay. Glen is. Um, I'm assuming all the cities that aren't on this list. Okay. It may not Possibly. be in total, but um, largely. I think there's an underlying assumption in this that money means you're going to win. And I don't agree with that at all. Um, and I've seen that play out just in our city and other cities. Um, your reputation, what you stand for, and how people look at you um, 
also contribute to why you get elected. So I don't see wealth and limiting wealth. Somebody could come in and, and it happened last election. You put in a lot of money and you still don't win. So I'm not equating those two together. Um, so I have a bit of a problem with this. Is what Fort Collins is up to uh, because that's a it's a sizable city yeah I know uh, that's pretty just varied demographically and so I just I'd be interested in knowing their conversation and how they got to such low numbers um, and what the purpose behind that was and one thing I throw out there is the contribution limits limit the amount of the single contribution. Mm -hmm. They don't limit the number of contributions or the total amount contributed. So you know, $100 per contributor, there's, there's, no, there's no regulation that says you're limited to 10 contributions. And stuff at $100 per person, I mean... Well, you got to work really hard. No, but I mean, they, and I get that overall, you can have a million contributions, but if each person can only give you $100, then yeah. It's interesting, just, though, right? It's like, almost a partisan conversation. It is a partisan So that's, that's a question I have. Anyone else going to chime in on this? or? Well, the only other question I'm trying to wrap my head around is enforcement, and I know that we're supposed to talk about that later. So, I guess I'll just wait and wait for that thought later. So, if we did want to move forward with contribution limits, how do you, would, would you enforce that then as a city clerk? I think the simple answer is yes. Um, what does that mean? I think that's another conversation of what, it, what would be city council's expectation regarding the level of uh, investigation that we would put into that. Uh -huh. Do we accept the reports as provided um, and wait for a complaint to be filed and then investigate? Or is council's expectation that the city clerk um, or staff would, would investigate every line of that report and call out any discrepancies? The, typically, the documents that are filed are filed under penalty of perjury. So um, it, it is a criminal act to file one of these reports, and let's say you had got a $10,000 contribution and decided to create $1,000 contributions with fake names. Um, would the city clerk catch it without independently investigating? Probably not. Is someone committing a crime? <laughs> the answer is yes. And so if the complaint's made, you would have probably not only the violation of the city's campaign finance regulations, but in that circumstance, you would actually probably end up reporting them to the DA as well. So, um, you know, I mean, it, it's, it, is, it is a document submitted under penalty of perjury in addition to the sort of how much independent investigation you would want your um, the person in charge of campaign finance in North Glen to, to deal with it. I, uh, I tend to agree with the mayor on the idea that it doesn't matter you know, where the money comes from, if people don't like you, you don't get elected. <laughs> I kind of agree with that. I also think, you know, to Jenny's point, the fact that we don't have a limit kind of makes me go like this. You know, I, we should have some limit. Now, what that limit is, I don't know. Um, so, you know, it's, um, I mean, we're a small city, and I don't, I, I don't know that anybody would want to come and buy an election to make $1,000 a month. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't I mean, it's possible, but if you were corrupt and you were influenced by somebody, then, and you were going to do something for somebody, then maybe, I, I, don't, I that, don't That That is precisely the policy question. I mean, that really is, is the concern about whether in North Glen, the absence of donation limits is a problem. If it is a problem, then this is the type of ordinance that would. Yeah, to me, perception is very important. You know? And if, if somebody raises a ton of money at 
two dollars a donor, what's the difference in somebody giving me a ton of money, one donor, and we end up equal? Well, I think the perception is what's mm -hmm. different because you either have 2,000 supporters or you have. Well, I mean, that's the point. You, know, <laughs> yeah, you, get, so. you, you have enough people that like you. Right. But maybe they don't vote in the city. You know? Yeah. And you think in partisan, I mean, you go on a website and it says everybody donate $5, and people from New York say, yeah, I like that guy. Mm -hmm. $5. Dollars. So. But your vote is your own and how you perceive the um, contributions, everybody would perceive the contributions differently. So I don't, I still stand by that. I don't think that the money matters. Um, I don't think we've ever come across this in North Nome before where people were donating huge amounts personally, and not personally, but from individual donors. Um, I don't know, I just, to me, I think it's unnecessary, but. Thank you. First, I want to understand, was there, is there a problem that had occurred before for us to bring this, or is this more trying to be a precautionary item? Second thing, if it's money in politics, it, it just seems like if I'm able to put in a million dollars of my own money and still have all of that support and all that money in, then would we put a cap on that? Then it just seems interesting, like the money is still playing in politics heavily, I think, if that's what we're trying to to move ourselves away from, right? So, I'm just trying to understand. No, I, I completely hear that. I think we spend a lot of time thinking about the future of our city and what regulations we need to put into place to have, um, to, to create equity. And to me, this is just one more of those things where we're thinking ahead and um, you know, we may not have people dropping $20,000 of someone else's money into the race, but the reality is that people coming into these races um, who may serve in the future are probably not going to have the resources that some of the people around this table have today. Um, and I, I think it's incumbent upon us to think about how we, how we, how we make this process more transparent. Um, and more and more fair and to your point Jordan there is a lot of money in politics it's something that people talk about pretty regularly and have a lot of apathy about um, because they think that politicians are bought and paid for and I, I think that extends to the city level and I think that this is one way of fighting back against that and saying no we're not that's literally what I was wondering the conversation was in Fort Collins so like there has to be a reason that those are so low. No, totally, and it's like that's the question. Um, what? I, that's just such an interesting number because it's such an outlier. So we set a limit, and there's two candidates, and the one candidate is getting no money from any donors. Has you know can't self fund or whatever, not getting money, and the other person has is getting money in. I still, I still don't see where this, enforcing this, helps that person who can't bring in the money. I mean, that's a problem with that person raising the money. It, setting these restrictions on how much you can donate to a person, I don't understand how that helps that person at all. I think those are two separate things, right? The person who's not raising money may just be a bad candidate, right? Or maybe doesn't have um, the, the resources or the training for that matter to you know how to run the campaign. Um, but I think, you know, whether the person is self-funding or not, I think that the point is trying to, I mean, again, going back to some of these policy statements, fighting corruption or the appearance of corruption, right? Like, I think to some of our, our constituents, us being able to say, look, we can only take $500 or $1,000 from one person as opposed to, you know, $50,000 from an oil and gas company, right? Like, I think that that cuts down on corruption as well as the perception that we're in somebody's back pocket. Okay. Would anyone else like to chime in on this point and then we'll move to the next? I think one thing that I keep thinking about when I'm, when I'm thinking about all of these, all of these provisions in here is what, what type of elections do we want to see in our play? Um, I think is a good place. What's our end game? And I think what's important for me is because Northland is small, we're very unique, we've run by wards, which is different than Westminster, right? Who runs at large. 
um, we're a different type of, you know, turf than um, other other cities. So when I'm thinking about the end game, what I really think is best for elections is that you know people are interacting with our residents as much as possible, that they are knocking on doors or going to you know meetings and events and really talking to people. So I'm wondering, you know, would any of these, how do these impact the elections we want to see, where people are interacting with our residents? And that is why, you know, I am leaning more towards like a contribution limit because we don't want people just to send out 50,000 mailers. And yes, everyone knows your name, that's great, and maybe that's why they'll vote for you, but I want them, I want that in to have a conversation with the people they're representing and you know, walk down the roads and get the complaints about how their road is not paved. And you know, you have to go through the, the hard door knocking days, I think, to, to get a good feel. So two things. Number one is you could choose not to have contribution limits and still do this ordinance. And the ordinance would capture that area by saying the city has no contribution limits. So I want to make sure that. <clears throat> Second thing is, if you self-fund, you can yeah. still do your 50,000 flyers. <laughs> so just for what it's worth. You can't give to, to people that are running as a candidate. You have to go knock on a, on a door. I mean, you know, that's, I know that's your, what you'd like to see them do. And well, that's, that's what you that's do. That's who we want. I know, but that doesn't mean you we can't dictate to people how to run their campaign. I think that's what I'm trying to tell you. So. Well, really terrible people knock on doors, too. <laughs> 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 they chase you sometimes. <laughs> yeah. you like, we get better people because they're yes. walking the streets. Yeah. That's not a guarantee either. Marcy? Um, so probably not any surprise, but I'm not in support of any of these items. So I me with the state. I think if I put on my resident hat, what's a greater, um, so I mean we could talk about like the donation amounts and so on and so forth and I guess then I'd argue um, who I want in my city running isn't a candidate who has gotten most of their donations from someone who lives outside of the city and from groups who are outside of the city when we're such a small city, um, talk about perception, we can all have our different perceptions so my perception there is like you're getting in here because you're going to the next level and to me that's an issue that I have so I mean I think if you ask a resident and you talk about transparency and fairness and all that um, I don't personally think that's fair to the city to have the influx of money for a campaign for someone that you don't even live here like you're funneling money into a candidate that you don't even live here to vote for them perception wise I have a bigger issue than that than with a contribution amount Kind of come about that is, I mean, if we're going to put contribution limits on individuals who are contributing to our campaign, would it be a possibility to put a contribution limit on yourself for self funding? I don't think so. I can double check, but I, I believe there's issues with that. It's just interesting to think like, if I had a million dollars and I won my election because I sent out a million mailers, that's where the, I think the problem lies more so than so a million. Yeah, that a million friends who can give me a hundred dollars, and I'm lucky you know and I have a million cousins. <laughs> but that's more of my thing than it would be like if I'm super wealthy and I can. My husband is super wealthy, and we can just dump all his money on the campaign. So I would like to see if there, if that is a possibility to of to cap yourself. And I'll tell you why I don't like that idea. Self-funding because. Um, somebody who goes out and gets so I can't self fund and I don't have connections in a political party to go out and get funded by all the little PACs and everything else so then that's not a level playing field there either that way doesn't work either to me so I don't even think that that's political party you're thinking like all his contributions are going to come from political parties I'm saying somebody who's got no connections and cannot self fund and also where are they going to get the money so why limit self-funding? Yeah, I mean, so then that person can't self-fund and they can't, they don't have the connections to go out and get money from other people. They should be able to self-fund. Well, that goes to Julie's point, they'd be knocking doors to get contributions throughout the community for supporters to donate your campaign because they believe in you and your leadership. But me believing in myself, I agree with that. I give a million dollars 
my own money. Uh, it does, I don't think it does just for this, these residents in such a small and city. It also like, guarantee young. that you're going to win an election by putting Very in a bunch true. of money. So. Both ways. Well, how did you find that largest amount? I didn't. And actually, I know I can't find it, but it's not as easy as I thought it would be because okay. I'm going to have to flip you're through yeah. all well, of the reports. I, but months. I can definitely provide that. Um, one thing about the limiting a, a candidate's uh, funding, you'll notice that some municipalities have what they call voluntary spending limits, but the key word is it's voluntary. If we, I would definitely, yeah. I, mean, I think Corey would agree, could not be mandatory because then you get into some constitutional rights um, that you would be imposing on. How, and it, how you spend your own money is a First Amendment issue. That's ultimately the issue with, with self-funding. Still trying to figure out the issue because I do, I don't know, maybe I go back and forth, but I feel like for larger, higher profile, bigger, <coughs> bigger levels of government, it probably makes sense because I have plenty of opinions about recent <laughs> big races. Um, but this um, North Glen is so small, and I just and I, I can't help, when I look at this chart, I can't help but feel that it's a partisan conversation. Because when I look at certain cities, and I think about their politics, and I think about their demographics, and I see their contributions, that's, they're, they're making a belief statement. And so, it's, it's just an interesting, that's the most interesting part of this packet to me, is different cities and where they landed in this conversation. And, I just, I'm, I'm puzzled. I'm like, do we have we had issues? Do we? Because we still have reporting, right? So if we had some issue where we thought someone voted a certain way, because someone paid them to get elected. This was a council-generated issue, so it's a, it's a question for for the group about whether there are issues. Um, neither Joanna nor I or Heather, I think, would have brought this issue forward but for council requesting. And just so council understands, I'm a member of the International City County Management Association. So my name on this memo is simply from a transmittal perspective. I cannot, given my code of ethics as a local government city manager, take um, a stance or recommend, oppose any of what's being discussed tonight. So that's why Joanna and Corey are the lead on the, responding to this request. <laughs> is there anyone who wants to weigh in again? Uh, it's just different with us. Is there anyone that wants to add anything to this first item? I just don't see that there's a problem at this point. I, I, you know, and I said yes. Let's look at it. You know, because you asked to look at it. But I personally don't see that there's a problem. I've walked on many streets and knocked on many doors, and I don't think anyone's really asked me you know, how much money I had received. You know, maybe they've checked the reports. You know, that's one thing. But they don't, they, they don't, uh, they haven't said to me, you know, how much money did Jordan give me or how much money did Jenny give me? You know, they didn't do that. So they're more interested in me knocking on the door and talking to them and being part of the community. So I don't see a problem with the way we're doing it right now. Anyone else want to weigh in on this? <coughs> okay, can we move to item two? Go ahead. So this is the question that I think Corey brought up a great point of, if we're not if we're not gonna pass this as a consensus, is it worth going to the other items or do we have to fix this to be able to agree to the others? Or I'm just confused on that piece, I guess. Good point. So let's let's talk big picture. Okay, yeah. let's take it. So these are the five items that were requested to be discussed. And um, when Joanna and I were talking about this, she very correctly said, look, if we're gonna be all in, <laughs> here's all the other issues we need to talk about. Um, and frankly, we can talk about all the legalese in the world, but to me, the most important part about any campaign finance regulations at the local level is whether they work for the person that's administering them. And so I think it's important that things like, look, I mean, Joanna knows how the state level works, but she also knows if, if there is local regulations, how it might be easier for her, hypothetically. So part of this discussion is 
do you want to do you want to venture into the entire area? And maybe it's better to have the discussion about do you want to venture into the entire area? And if there's not a consensus to venture into the entire area, we don't have to go through all the items. We can do it either way. Can you define the total area? Yeah, I'm just, I just got confused. I, I think the whole area is venturing, having local campaign finance regulations. As Joanna said, if you're going to go into this area, you're either all in or all out. Um, I happen to think there's one potential exception because the issue about what you can spend the money on and, and the, the discussion tonight was about, you know, for example, elder care. Yeah, it's different. The campaign finance regulations are silent. It says you can't use it for personal expenses, but you can use it for election related. Do I think that, the, that North Glen could interpret the state regulations? I think that's a possibility. So that's the one item I think you could theoretically regulate without being, quote, all in. Because I don't think you would be doing anything different. Because there's no regulation. But all of the other ones, if you're going to venture in, you've got to have regulations that cover everything. Along that same point, I think in the Ledge Committee, there's a, a piece of legislation coming through at the state <coughs> level to to address that when it comes to elder care and those other things. So and then if so, then regardless, it would, it would trump everything. Then that would be, if that right. passed, then you're right. Yeah. But right now, it's not there. Yeah. Because, I mean, personally speaking on my behalf, I would like to see, when it comes to self-funding and, and the breakdown of that before I would say one way or the other this evening. And uh, same to Meredith's point, I would like to see the reasoning behind um, Fort Collins, too. But the, the, dif the difficulty we have is it was it was requested that this be brought up quickly so that if it is council's desire to have local campaign finance regulations, it would be in effect for your November election. And so that's why we're talking about this tonight. Um, this will de if council desires to have local campaign finance regulations, um, I think the way Joanna structured the memo, which is absolutely correct, is this is the first of at least two discussions because we need to get further direction. Um, but we've, we've hit one of probably eight or nine issues so far. So I don't think it's any surprise that I think it's really important for us to continue working through the five items because if we are going to have no contribution limits, I do think we need to be talking about requiring disclosures on campaign materials that include who those materials are paid for by. Because right now, somebody can go and have a million signs printed and put them up all over town, and you don't know who they're paid for by because they're not required to put who paid for them. Same with mailers, same with notepads left in you know businesses. I mean, all of that should have a paid for by so that people can follow the money if they want and make the decisions that are right for them based on their values. And so I think I think it's really important to continue to have these discussions. Well, on that point, can we take it separately? You can default to the state regulation as part of your regulations. So if you decide, you can say affirmatively in your local regulations, we will have no contribution limits. But you have to you have to touch all these items in your local regulations if you decide to do it. So in that sense, it is all in. By state regulation, to address your point, didn't they take that piece out where it said paid for by whoever? Look on page five, it says that the language is a little different, but it's in there for certain things. Years ago, I remember you had to put paid for by you know, mm -hmm. or whatever, or organization. But then recently, I was told you didn't have to do that, so. Only on certain things, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. And we took that out personally? No, no, no it, in the FCPA. Yeah. is if you don't if we look at that we can't take effect on that um, if we don't agree on something else say item number one correct no you so can you can 
if, if there are two or three of these items that you think are critical, you still need to occupy the field, but you can say, you can basically um, copy and paste the state regulations as your own, more or less. The big difference is the Secretary of State will no longer be responsible for administering your regulations if you go all in, even if you're using what are largely state provisions, it'll be the city clerk. Most of them you can't even read on the signs. You're so small. I mean, if you, you know, set so. a font limit, set a font limit. But I, I think that there's there's got to be something that we're taking action on instead of just saying we're, we don't, don't care. I don't see it as a problem. I, I think we're going to impact the city clerk's office heavily with all the different regulations that we might be doing. So, Personally. so that might be the one that I actually agree with. Um, fine to put it on there whether it's individual or your campaign but I was actually just going to ask um, you know we always kind of see this in budget impact or staffing levels and I realize it's a small, short time period during the year but I am just interested in hearing from your perspective city clerk's office time and ability to administer us having our own well I think the priority would be communicating the changes to the potential candidates and then as far as the enforcement, I, I'm not quite sure. I think it's uh, something that our current staff can uh, take care of without having a cycle under our belts to see you know, exactly what that looked like, how many candidates we had, you know, the, the, the different materials. You know, the, it's kind of the, the unknown right now, honestly. One of the things that I don't think you can predict is different communities have had different experiences with complainants. And so some communities have um, frequent complainants <laughs> and the city clerk's office. So if North Glen becomes that community, it will have a significant impact on, on the city clerk's office. And you just, there's no way of knowing. So for me to, to move forward, because we want to, it's late and we want to get through this. So. Does the council desire to move through item by item, or do we want to talk about is there consensus that we want to implement our own local control or just stay with the state? So first, how would we like to proceed? I agree with some of the items. Um, yeah. And I'd like to research on some of the others. Timeline process, do I think, what does that look like? if we need further research in some of the items. Depends what the items are. I mean, it's hard to predict. Um, I, I feel there's a rush to get it done by this November. Um, that, that is certainly why we brought this forward as quickly as we did. We didn't even talk about item three, and that is definitely going to impact your workload. So I, I don't know. I, I see interesting points in all of this, but I don't feel like we need to move forward with it right now. I would think we would need to unpack it a little more. I see pieces on each page that make sense to me, and then otherwise I'm like, uh, I don't think we're ready yeah. to say yes on these things. I agree to that. So I am hearing that there is not consensus to move forward with this. Who is um, in favor of moving forward positively tonight and going through this? I would support that. <clears throat> okay. Can I, can I ask a different fire. question? Please. Um, who wants to try to get this done for the November 2019 election? Because that's a different question. I mean, I, I'm hearing a lot of um, discussion about wanting to look at various issues. Again, we brought this forward tonight with the eye towards doing it for the November 2019 election. Um, it can be a longer term conversation addressing a lot of these issues um, and probably more robust on each item if we're not trying to get it done in the next couple months to hit the November 2019 election. I agree to that. You know, I think, I think it's, it's tough with the time frame we already have. Like, we're already in mid-March. I mean, I don't know how many, have any candidates filed so far? We 
have. There has been two something. candidates have filed. Two, two candidates have filed. Yeah. Okay. So I feel like we're it's going to be really tight to kind of push this through. I'm okay with continuing this conversation. I think it needs to happen. Does it need to happen by well before November 2018? Because November 2018 or 2019. Sorry, <laughs> I'm in last year. November 2019. I mean that's when the candidates are already you know belts are out in October. You know we're already going to be tough to kind of catch up. I think this conversation still needs to happen. Um, and apparently it's going to be a really long process because we do have a lot of, you know, questions that might be more research. So Cause I think Joanna and I could um, probably put this into better bite size <laughs> morsels um, and, and create sort of a schedule of long so we could <coughs> kind of go issue by issue and, and um, develop a policy to figure out whether it's something that the city wants going forward and, and divide it into more manageable bits if we know we're not trying to get it for the November 2019 election. I would be open to that, um, especially if we have a schedule and we outline what pieces, what chunks we're taking of the policy with a plan to adopt something later on in the future that after we're able to better and assess the needs of of the clerk's office because I think that there are a lot of opportunities here for us especially when it comes to the way in which we're filing reports I mean I think it's really difficult and, and you and I've had this conversation um, Joanna around I think it's difficult to handwrite um, all of our reports and I think that there's a lot of emerging technology that can help us um, better report contributions especially if we don't have the interest in um, capping contributions um, so I, I think that there's a lot um, of potential um, in terms of, of what we can really make this look like and I think there's an opportunity to position your office as a leader um, amongst municipalities so I'm, I'm open to having the conversation throughout the year can I make a suggestion and this might be a little bit unusual but because we can't read your, your collective minds in terms of what issues matter and I think Joanna and I could come up with almost an issue identifier to send out to you to say here are all the possible issues which ones matter and get some responses so we can frame it better and not try to speculate as to what matters to all of you okay. and, and can I just come up with a suggestion I really like these boxes that you put like mm -hmm. proposed regulation mm -hmm. current regulation and new actions because even that spurs questions that I could give back to you about you know, is this what this actually means, or what about this scenario? Um, because I think that could help the conversation move a little quicker. Because I mean, there's lots of questions that were just popped up, and there's no way I expect you to know all of these answers right now. That's impossible. On the line, this is a great number. Yeah, mm -hmm. I do want to say that. I could go back to what Councilmember Wolfer <clears throat> said about it's item number number three the frequency of filing reports. Under the best practices and points for discussion items, um, there is uh, the, the bottom uh, bullet on that one, which says reports should be made available to the public online and in a timely manner, or in a timely manner and in user-friendly formats. Uh, I 100% agree with that. And I, I made a notation that that is more of an administrative function of the city clerk's office. I don't think that's a policy item so much. Um, and that item can absolutely be prioritized regardless of the result of this item tonight. And, and that is definitely something, you know, the, the fillable forms that actually work um, so that folks have the option of submitting electronically. Um, or, or in writing if need be. And then in providing those in a timely manner to the public and definitely, I know a lot of cities are moving to providing that information in databases that can be searched. And, and, and that is something that may you know, incur the use of, a, of an outside product or piece of software. But that is something that the city clerk's office would like to move forward with regardless. Because I think it's just a, it's an accompanying piece that can uh, be improved regardless of how council decides to proceed with this. Yep. So, yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. So, is, so we're going to table tonight, then, this discussion for a future discussion? What was your, your question was? No, I think we can put together some a communication to council that has basically all of the issues that could be captured 
and get a sense from council which issues matter that you want us to, I mean, for example, and, and this was an issue that Joanna brought up when we were having our discussion, when you talk about contribution limits, it's hard to discuss it without talking about who the contributor is, because there, do you want to contribute, do you want to prohibit corporations from contributing? Um, I mean, so there's a whole host of issues related to, it's not just limits, it's who is going to be contributing to the campaigns in Northland. Well, we're required to do that now, right? Pardon? Not like corporations are prohibited. No, but I mean, any, any donor. When no, do, but when we do our, our report. But currently, under state law, corporations are prohibited. Oh. Some communities have taken that restriction out. <laughs> so, I mean, those are, those are big. <laughs> when you're talking about money and all of the issues that you discussed on item number one, it's not just the limits, it's the identity of the person making the contribution. And that wasn't one of the five, but it is tied in <laughs> to those issues. So that's why um, if we, we, we can sort of go through the state regulations and really pull out what we think the issues are for you to consider, and then you can tell us which ones matter. And then provide a schedule of future conversations. Thank you for all your work on this, too. That's the best one we're on. Can you speak towards the cameras? I'm going to steal it. Take it. We are adjourned. See you soon.